Part 5 Chapter 29 The Time for Vengeance The untimely death of Carrie left a hole in the lives of all of us who loved her. Now the little porcelain dolls were mine to cherish and keep. Chris went away to be a resident at the University of Virginia, just so he wouldn't be too far from me. Stay, Catherine, pleaded Paul, when I told him I was going back to my place in the mountains to pick up my life as dance instructor. Don't go and leave me alone again. Jory needs a father. I need a wife. He needs a man to emulate. I'm sick to death of having you to love only once in a while. Later, I said with hard determination, backing off from his arms, I'll come to you one day and we will be married, but I have some unfinished business to attend to first. Soon I was back into my routine of work, not far from where the Foxworths lived in their mansion. I settled down to scheming. Jory was a problem now that I didn't have Carrie. He grew tired at the dance school and wanted to play with children his own age. I enrolled him in a special preschool and hired a maid to help out with the housework and stay with Jory when I wasn't there. At night I went on the prowl, looking, of course, for one particular man. So far he had eluded me, but sooner or later fate would see that we met. God help you then, Mama. The local newspaper gave Bartholomew Winslow a big write-up when he opened his second law office in Hillendale while his junior partner ran his first office in Green Glenna. Two offices, I thought. What money couldn't buy? I didn't plan on being so bold as to approach him directly. Ours would be an accidental confrontation. Leaving Jory in the care of Emma Lindstrom as he played in our fenced-in yard with two other children, I drove my car to the woods that weren't so far from Foxworth Hall. Bart Winslow was a celebrity of sorts, with all the details of his life explored, so I knew from the news story that it was his habit to jog a few miles each day before breakfast. Indeed, he would need a strong heart for what was coming up in his near future. For days on end, I jogged myself, using dirt paths that twisted and turned, cluttered by dead, dry and crackling leaves. It was September, and Carrie had been dead a month. Sad thoughts while I sniffed the pungent aroma of wood fires burning and heard the noise of wood being chopped. Sounds and smells Carrie should be enjoying. They'll pay, Carrie. I'll make them pay. And somehow, I forgot Bart Winslow didn't have anything to do with it. Not him. Only her. How quickly time passed and I was getting nowhere. Where was he? I couldn't prowl the singles bars. That was too commonplace and too obvious. When we met... And some day we had to. He'd say something that was a cliché, or I would, and that would be the beginning, or the ending I had in mind since the first time I laid eyes on Bartholomew Winslow dancing with my mother on Christmas night. As contrary as life would be, I didn't meet him jogging. One Saturday noon, I sat in a sleazy café, and suddenly Bart Winslow sauntered in the door. He glanced around spied me seated by the windows and came toward me in his three-piece lawyer's suit that must have cost a fortune. With attaché case in hand, he actually swaggered. His smile was wide, his lean, tanned face slightly sinister. Or maybe it was me scaring myself. Well, he drawled, as I'll live and breathe if it isn't Catherine Dahl, the very woman I've been hoping to run into for months. He set down his attaché case sat across from me without my invitation, then leaned on his elbows to peer into my eyes with intense interest. "'Where the hell have you hidden yourself?' he asked, using his foot to draw his case nearer and guard it. "'I haven't hidden myself,' I said, feeling nervous and hoping it wouldn't show. He laughed as his dark eyes scanned over my tight sweater and skirt and what he could see of my foot that nervously swung. Then his face grew solemn. I read in the newspaper about your sister's death. I am very sorry. It always hurts to hear of someone so young dying. If it's not too personal, may I ask what killed her? A disease? An accident? My eyes opened wide. What killed her? Oh, I could write a book about that. Why don't you ask your wife what killed my sister, I said stiffly. 
He appeared startled, then shot out, How can she know when she doesn't know you or your sister? Yet I saw her with the clipping cut from the obituary page, and she was crying when I snatched it from her hand. I demanded an explanation. She got up and ran upstairs. She still refuses to answer my questions. Just who the hell are you, anyway? I bit again into my ham, tomato, and lettuce sandwich and chewed irritatingly slowly just to watch his vexation. Why not ask her? I said again. I do hate people who answer questions with questions, he snapped, then motioned to a red-haired waitress who hovered nearby and gave her his order to have the same as I. Now, he said, scooting his chair forward, some time ago I came to your dance studio and showed you those blackmail letters you keep writing to my wife. He reached into his pocket and pulled out three I'd written years ago, from the dog-eared look of them and the many stamps and cancellations, they had followed her about the world to end up again in my hands, with him almost shouting again, Who the hell are you? I smiled to charm him, my mother's smile. I tilted my head as she did hers and fluttered one hand up to play with my simulated pearls. Do you really have to ask? Can't you guess? Don't play coy with me. Who are you really? What is your relationship to my wife? I know you look like her. Same hair, same eyes, and even some of your mannerisms are the same. You must be some kind of relative. Yes, you could say that. Then why haven't I met you before? A niece? Cousin? He had a strong animal magnetism that almost frightened me from playing the kind of game I had in mind. This was no adolescent boy who would be timidly impressed with a former ballerina. His dark appeal was strong, almost overwhelming me. Oh, what a wild lover he'd make. I could drown in his eyes, and making love with him I'd be forever lost to any other man. He was too confidently masculine, too assured. He could smile and be at ease while I fidgeted and longed to escape before he led me down the trail I thought I'd wanted up until this very moment. Come, he said, reaching to forcefully restrain my departure when I rose to go. Stop looking so frightened and play the game you've had in mind for some time. He picked up the letters and held them before my eyes. I looked away, unhappy with myself. Don't turn away your eyes. Five or six of your letters came while my wife and I were in Europe, and she'd see them and paled. She'd swallow nervously, as you were swallowing nervously now. Her hand would lift to play with her necklace, just as you are playing with your beads now. Twice I saw her write on the envelope, address unknown. Then one day I collected the mail, and I found these three letters you'd written to her. I opened them. I read them. He paused, leaned forward so his lips were only inches from mine. His voice came hard and cold and fully in control of any savagery he might feel. What right have you to try and blackmail my wife? I'm sure the color left my cheeks. I know I felt sick and weak and wanted to flee this place and him. I imagined I heard Chris's voice saying, Let the past rest in peace. Let it go, Kathy. God in his own way will eventually work the vengeance you want, in his own way at his own speed. He will take the responsibility from your shoulders. Here was my chance to spill it forth, all of it. Let him know just what kind of woman he'd married. Why couldn't my lips part and my tongue speak the truth? Why don't you ask your wife who I am? Why come to me when she has all the answers? He leaned back against the gaudy, bright, orange, plastic-covered chair and took out a silver cigarette case with his monogram in diamonds. That just had to be a gift to him from my mother. It looked like her. He offered that case to me. I shook my head. He tapped the loose tobacco from one end and then lit the other with a silver lighter with diamonds, too. All the while his dark, narrowed eyes held mine, and like a fly caught in a web of my own making, I waited to be pounced upon. Each letter you write says you need desperately a million dollars, he said in a flat monotone, then blew smoke directly into my face. I coughed and fanned the air. All around the walls bore signs reading no smoking. Why do you need a million? I watched the smoke. It circled and came directly to me, wreathed about my head and neck. 
Look, I said, struggling to regain my control. You know my husband died. I was expecting his child, and I was inundated with bills I couldn't pay. And even after the insurance paid off with some assistance from you, still I'm going under. My damn school is in the red. And I have a child to support, and I need things for him to save for his college education. And your wife has so many millions. I thought she could part with just one. His smile was faintly cynical. He blew smoke rings to make me dodge and cough again. Why would an intelligent woman like you presume to think my wife would be so generous as to turn over one dime to a relative she doesn't even claim? Ask her why. I have asked her. I took your letters and pushed them in her face and demanded to know what it was all about. A dozen times I've asked just who you are and how you are connected to her. Each time she says she doesn't know you except as a ballerina she's seen dance. This time I want straight answers from you. To assure that I didn't turn my face and hide my eyes, he reached forward to firmly grip my chin so I couldn't turn my head. Who the hell are you? How are you connected to my wife? Why should you think she would pay you blackmail money? Why should your letters send her running upstairs to take out a picture album she keeps locked in her desk drawer or in a safe, an album she quickly hides and locks away whenever I come into the room? She took the album? The blue album with a gold eagle on the leather cover, I whispered, shocked that she would do that. Everywhere we go, the blue album goes with her in one of her locked trunks. His dark eyes narrowed dangerously. You describe that blue and gold album exactly, though it's old and worn shabby now. While my wife looks in a picture album, my mother-in-law reads her Bible to rags. Sometimes I catch my wife crying over the photographs that blue album holds, which I presume are pictures of her first husband. I sighed heavily and closed my eyes. I didn't want to know she cried. Answer me, Kathy. Who are you? I felt he would grip my chin and hold me there throughout eternity if I didn't speak up and say something, and for some stupid reason I lied. Henrietta Beach was your wife's half-sister. You see, Malcolm Foxworth had an extramarital affair, and three children were the result. I am one. Your wife is my half-aunt. Ah, he sighed, releasing my chin and leaning back in his chair as if satisfied I was telling the truth. Malcolm had an affair with Henrietta Beach, who gave him three illegitimate children. <laughs> what extraordinary information! He laughed mockingly. I never thought the old devil had it in him, especially after that heart attack soon after my wife married the first time. Gives a man inspiration to know that. He sobered then to give me a long and searching look. Where is your mother now? I'd like to see and talk to her. Dead, I said, hiding my hands under the table and keeping my fingers crossed like a superstitious, silly child. She's been dead a long, long time. Okay, I get the picture. Three young, illegitimate fox with children hoping to cash in on their bloodline by blackmailing my wife, right? Wrong. It was only me. Not my brother or my sister. I only want what is due us. At the time I wrote those letters, I was in a desperate situation, and even now I'm not much better off. The hundred thousand the insurance paid didn't go very far. My husband had run up huge bills, and we were behind in our rent and car payments. Plus, I owed hospital bills for him, the money for his funeral, and then the costs of having my baby. I could go on all night telling you my damn school's problems and how I was tricked into believing it was a profitable going concern. And it's not. Not when it consists of so many little rich girls who take off and go on vacations two or three times a year and aren't really serious about dancing anyway. All they want to do is look pretty and feel graceful. If I had one really good student, it would be worth all my efforts. But I don't have one. Not one. He drummed his strong fingertips on the tablecloth, looking deeply reflective. Next, he had a cigarette lit again, not as if he truly enjoyed smoking, but more as if he had to have something to keep his restless fingers busy. He inhaled deeply, then looked me straight in the eyes. I'm going to speak very frankly to you, Catherine Dahl. First, I don't know if you were lying or telling the truth. 
but you do look like a member of the Foxworth clan. Second, I don't like you trying to blackmail my wife. Third, I don't like to see her unhappy, so much so that she cries. Fourth, I happen to be very much in love with her, though there are times I admit I'd like to choke the past from her throat. She is full of secrets my ears will never hear. And one great big secret I've never heard before is that Malcolm Neil Foxworth, the good, pious, saintly gentleman, had a love affair after he had heart trouble. Now, before his heart trouble, I happen to know he had at least one, possibly, but no more. Oh, he knew more than I. I had shot an arrow into the sky, not knowing it would hit a bullseye. Bart Winslow glanced about the café. Families were coming in to dine early, and I suppose he feared someone might recognize him and report back to his wife, my mother. Come on, Kathy, let's get out of here, he urged, getting to his feet and reaching to pull me on mine. You can invite me to have a drink in your home, then we can sit and talk, and you can tell me everything in more detail. Twilight came like a quickly dropped shade to the mountains. Suddenly it was evening, and we'd been hours in that café, we were on the sidewalk when he held my cardigan sweater for my arms to fill the sleeves, though the air was so brisk I needed a jacket or coat. Your home, where is it? I told him, and he looked disconcerted. We'd better not go there. Too many people might see me go inside. He didn't know then, of course, I had chosen that cottage, mainly because it backed up to a wooded area, and there was plenty of privacy for a man to come and go on the sly. My face is in the newspapers so often, he continued. I'm sure your neighbors would see me. Could you call your babysitter and have her stay on a while longer? I did just that, speaking first to Emma Lindstrom and then to Jory, telling him to be a good boy until Mommy was home again. Bart's car was sleek and black, a Mercedes. It purred along like one of Julian's sleek luxury cars, so heavy it didn't rattle or clank, and firmly it gripped the curved mountain roads. Where are you taking me, Mr. Winslow? To a place where we can talk and no one will see us or hear us. He looked my way and grinned. You've been studying my profile. How do I rate? A hot rush of blood heated my face. Knowing I was blushing made me blush again, so then I felt damp. My life was full of handsome men, but this man was far different from any I had known, a rakish bandit type of man who was filling me with alarm signals. Go slow with this one, my intuitiveness warned as I studied his face and took note. Everything, his expensive, beautifully fitted suit, shouted that he should be as determined as I was in getting what he wanted, when he wanted. Well, I drawled, to make a mockery of this, your looks tell me to run fast and lock the door behind me. Wickedly, he grinned again, seemingly satisfied. So, you find me exciting and a bit dangerous. Nice. To be handsome but boring would be worse than being ugly and charming, wouldn't it? I wouldn't know. If a man is charming and intelligent enough, I often forget how he actually looks and think he's handsome regardless. Then you must be easily pleased. I shifted my eyes and sat up primly. Truthfully, Mr. Winslow, Bart... Truthfully, Bart, I am very difficult to please. I'm inclined to put men up on a pedestal and think of them as perfect. As soon as I find out they have feet of clay, I fall out of love, become indifferent. Not many women know themselves so well, he mused. Most go around never knowing what they are beneath their facade. At least I know where I stand. A sex symbol not on a pedestal. No, I'd never put him on a pedestal. I knew him for what he was, a womanizer, a skirt chaser, wind and fire, enough to drive a jealous wife crazy. Certainly my mother had never bought that sex manual to instruct him how to or when to and where to. He'd know everything. Abruptly he pulled his car to a stop, then turned to meet my gaze. Even in the darkness the whites of his dark eyes shone. Too virile, too vibrant for a man who should be showing signs of aging. He was eight years younger than my mother. That made him forty years old. A man's most attractive time. His most vulnerable time. His time to think youth would soon be over. 
He'd have to make his new conquests now, before the sweet and fleeting bird of youth had flown away and taken with it all the young and pretty girls that could have been his. And he must be tired of the wife he knew so well, though he professed to love her. Why, then, were his eyes gleaming, challenging me? Oh, Mama, wherever you are, you should be down on your knees praying. For I'm not going to show you mercy, no more than you showed us. Yet as I sat there, summing him up, I realized he was no self-sacrificing, quiet man like Paul. This one wouldn't need seducing. He'd do that himself, staccato time. He'd stalk like a black panther until he had what he wanted, and then he'd walk out and leave me, and it would be all over. He was not going to give up his chance to inherit millions, and the pleasures millions gave for some chance mistress who came his way. Red lights were flashing behind my eyes. Go easy, do it right, for there's danger if you do it wrong. As I measured him, he was measuring me in just about the same way. Did I remind him too much of his wife so there would be no real difference? Or was my likeness to her an advantage? After all, didn't men always fall over and over again for the same type? Beautiful night, he said. This is my favorite season. Fall is so passionate, even more than spring... Come walk with me, Kathy. This place puts me in a strange, melancholy mood, as if I've got to run fast to catch up with the best thing in my life, which up until now has always eluded me. You sound poetic, I said, as we left his car and he caught hold of my hand. We began to stroll, with him deftly guiding me, would you believe it, alongside a railroad track in the country. It seemed so familiar, yet it couldn't be, could it? Not the same railroad track that had taken us as children to Foxworth Hall fifteen years ago when I was twelve. Bart, I don't know about you, but I've got the weirdest feeling that I have walked this path with you before, on some other night before this. Déjà vu, he said. I have that same feeling. As if once you and I were deeply in love and we walked through those woods over there, we sat on that green bench beside these train tracks, I was compelled to bring you here, even when I didn't know where it was I was driving to. This forced me to stare up into his face to see if he could be serious. From his bemused and slightly discomforted look, I believe he was surprising himself. I like to ponder all things considered impossible or implausible, I said. I want everything impossible to become possible, and everything implausible to reverse and become reality. Then, when everything is explainable, I want new mysteries to confront me, so I always have something inexplicable to think about. You are a romantic. Aren't you? I don't know. I used to be when I was a boy. What made you change? You can't stay a boy with romantic notions when you go to law school and you are faced with the harsh realities of murder, rape, robbery, corruption... You have professors pounding dogmatic ideas into your head to drive out the romance. You go into law fresh and young, and you come out tough and hard, and you know every step of the way ahead you've got to fight and fight hard to be any good. Soon enough, you learn you are not the best, and the competition is astounding. He turned to smile with a great deal of winsome charm. I think, though, you and I have much in common, Catherine Dahl. I, too, had that need of the mysterious, the need to be confounded, and the need to have someone to worship. So I fell in love with an heiress to millions. But those millions she wanted to inherit got in my way. They put me off and scared me. I knew everyone would think I was marrying her just for her money. I think she thought it, too, until I convinced her otherwise. I fell for her hard before I knew who she was. In fact, I used to think she was like you. How could you think that? I asked, all tight inside from hearing his revelations. Because she was like you, Cathy, for a while. But then she inherited millions, and in great orgies of shopping she'd buy everything her heart desired. Soon there was nothing to wish for at all but a baby. And she couldn't have a baby. You can't imagine all the time we spent in front of shops that sold infant clothes, toys, and furniture... I married her knowing we couldn't have children, and I thought I didn't care. Soon I began to care too much. Those infant shops held a fascination for me, too. 
The faint path we followed led straight to the green bench stretched between two of the four rickety old green posts that supported a rusty tin roof. There we sat in the cold mountain air with the moon bright, the stars flickering on and off. Bugs were humming just as my blood was singing. This used to be a mail pick-up and drop-off station, Kathy. He lit another cigarette. They don't run the trains by here any more. The wealthy people who live nearby finally won their petition against the railroad company and put an end to trains that so inconsiderately blew their whistles at night and disturbed their rest. I was very fond of hearing the train whistles at night, but I was only twenty-seven, a bridegroom living in Foxworth Hall. I'd lie on my bed near my wife with a swan overhead. Can you believe that? She would sleep with her head on my shoulder or would hold hands all through the night. She took pills so she'd sleep soundly. Too soundly, for she never heard the beautiful music coming from overhead. It puzzled me so, and she said when I told her it was my imagination. Then one day it stopped, and I guess she was right. It was only my imagination. When the music ended, I missed it. I longed to hear it again. The music had given that old dry house some enchantment. I used to fall asleep and dream of a lovely young girl who danced overhead. I thought I was dreaming of my wife when she was young. She told me that often as a way of punishment her parents would send her into the attic schoolroom and force her to stay there all day, even in the summers, when the temperature up there must have been over a hundred degrees. And they sent her up there in the winters too. She said it was frigidly cold and her fingers would turn blue. She said she spent her time crouched on the floor near the window, crying because she was missing out on some fun thing her parents considered wicked. Did you ever go and take a look in the attic? No. I wanted to, but the double doors at the top of the stairs were always locked. And besides, all attics are alike. See one and you've seen them all. He flashed me a wicked smile. And now that I've revealed so much about myself, tell me about you. Where were you born? Where did you go to school? What made you take up dancing? And why haven't you ever attended one of those balls the Foxworths throw on Christmas night? I sweated, though I was cold. Why should I tell you everything about myself, just because you sat there and revealed a little about yourself? You didn't tell me anything of real importance. Where were you born? What made you decide to become an attorney? How did you meet your wife? Was it in the summer, the winter, what year? Did you know she'd been married before? Or did she tell you only after you were married? Nosy little thing, aren't you? What difference does it make where I was born? I haven't led an exciting life like you have. I was born in the nothing little town called Green Glenna, South Carolina. The Civil War ended the prosperous days of my ancestors, and we went steadily downhill, as did all the friends of the family. But it's an old story told so many times. Then I married a Foxworth lady, and prosperity reigned again in the South. My wife took my ancestral home and practically had it reconstructed and refurbished and spent more than if she had bought a new place. And what was I doing during all of this? A top grad from Harvard running around the world with his wife. I've done very little with my education. I've become a social butterfly. I've had a few court cases, and I helped you with your difficulties. And by the way, you never paid the fee I had in mind. I mailed you a check for two hundred dollars, I objected hotly. If that wasn't enough, please don't tell me now. I don't have another two hundred to give away. Have I mentioned money? Money means little to me now that I have so much of it at my disposal. In your special case, I had another kind of fee in mind. Oh, come off it, Bart Winslow. You've brought me way out into the country. Now, do you want to make love on the grass? Is it your lifelong ambition to make love to a former ballerina? I don't give sex away, and I don't pay any bills that way. And what's so attractive about you? A lapdog for a pampered, spoiled, rich woman who can buy anything she wants, including a much younger husband? Why, it's a wonder she didn't put a ring through your nose to lead you around and make you sit up and beg. He seized me then, hard and ruthlessly, then pressed his lips down on mine with a savagery that hurt. I fought him off with my fists, battering his arms as I tried to twist my head from beneath his. But whichever way my head went, right or left, up or down, he kept his kiss, 
demanding my lips to separate and yield to his tongue. Then, realizing I couldn't escape the arms of steel he banded about me to mold my form to his, against my will my arms stole up around his neck. My unruly fingers betrayed me and twined into his thick dark hair, and that kiss lasted and lasted and lasted until both of us were hot and panting, and then he thrust me from him so cruelly I almost fell from the bench. "'Well, little Miss Muffet, what kind of lapdog do you call me now? "'Or are you little Red Riding Hood who has just met the wolf? "'Take me home. "'I'll take you home, but not until I've enjoyed a little more of what you just gave.' "'He lunged again to seize me, but I was up and running, running for his car, "'running to seize my purse, so that when he got there "'I held my manicuring scissors ready to stab with. "'He grinned. "'reached out and wrested them from me. "'They would deliver a nasty scratch,' she mocked. "'But I don't like scratches except on my back. "'When I let you out, you can have your little two-inch scissors back again.' "'In front of my cottage, he handed me the scissors. "'Now, do your worst. "'Cut out my eyes, stab me in the heart. "'You might as well. "'Your kiss has begun it, but I still demand my total payment.' Chapter 30 Tiger by the Tail Early on a Sunday morning, a few days later, I was warming up at the bar in my bedroom. My small son was earnestly trying to do as I did. It was sweet to watch him in the mirror I'd moved from the dresser over to the bar. Am I dancing? asked Jory. Yes, Jory, you are dancing. Am I good? Yes, Jory, you are wonderful. He laughed and hugged my legs and looked up into my face with that ecstatic rapture only the very young can express. All the wonder of being alive was in his eyes, all the wonder of learning something new every day. I love you, Mummy. It was something we said to each other a dozen or more times each day. Mary's got a daddy. Why don't I have a daddy? That really hurt. You did have a daddy, Jory, but he went away to heaven. And maybe someday Mommy will find you a new daddy. He smiled because he was pleased. Daddies were big in his world, for all the children in the nursery school had one. All but Jory. Just then I heard the front door bang. A familiar voice called my name. Chris! He strode through the small house as I hurried toward him in my blue tights, leotards and point shoes. Our eyes met and locked. Without a word, he held out his arms, and I ran unhesitatingly into them, and though he sought my lips to kiss, he found only my cheek. Jory was pulling on his grey flannel trousers, eager to be swept up in strong, manly arms. "'How's my Jory?' asked Chris, after he kissed both round, rosy cheeks. My son's eyes were huge as they stared at him. "'Uncle Chris, are you my daddy?' "'No,' he said gruffly putting Jory again on his small feet. But I sure wish I had a son like you. This made me shift around uncomfortably so he couldn't see my eyes, and then I asked what he was doing here when he should be attending his patients. Got the weekend off, so I thought I'd spend it with you. That is, if you'll let me. I nodded weakly, thinking of someone else who was likely to come this weekend. I was as good as a resident can be and was rewarded and given a weekend without duty. He gave me one of his most winning smiles. "'Have you heard from Paul?' I asked. "'He doesn't come as often as he used to, and he doesn't write much either. "'He's away on another medical convention. "'I thought he always kept in touch with you.' "'He put just a little stress on the you. "'Chris, I'm worried about Paul. "'It isn't like him not to answer every letter I write.' "'He laughed and fell into a chair, then lifted Jory up on his lap.' Maybe, dear sister, you have finally met a man who can get over loving you. Now I didn't know what to say, or what to do with my legs and hands. I sat and stared down at the floor, feeling Chris's long, steady gaze trying to read my intentions. No sooner did I think that than he was asking, Kathy, what are you doing here in the mountains? What are you planning? Is it your scheme to take Bart Winslow from our mother?' My head jerked up. 
I met his narrowed blue eyes and felt the heat that sprang up from my heart. Don't question me like I'm some ten-year-old without a brain. I do what I have to, just as you do. Sure you do. I didn't have to ask, I know. It doesn't take a crystal ball to read you. I know what makes you tick and how your thoughts range. But leave Bart Winslow alone. He'll never leave her for you. She's got the millions and all you have is youth. There are thousands of younger women he can choose from. Why should he choose you? I didn't say anything. Just met his scowling look with my own confident smile, making him flush, then turn aside his face. I felt mean, cruel, and ashamed. Chris, let's not argue. Let's be friends and allies. You and I are all that's left out of four. His blue eyes grew soft as they studied me. I was only trying, as I am always trying. He looked around, then back to me. I share a room with another resident at the hospital. It would be nice if I could live here with you and Jory. It would be like it used to be. Just us. What he said made me stiffen. It would be a long drive for you every morning, and you couldn't be on immediate call. He sighed. I know, but how about the weekends? Every other weekend I have off-duty time. Would that bug you too much? Yes, it would bug me too much. I have a life of my own, Christopher. I watched him bite down on his lower lip before he forced a smile. Okay, have it your way. Do what you must, and I hope to God you won't be sorry. Will you please drop the subject? I smiled and went to him and hugged him close. Be good. Take me as I am, obstinate as Carrie. Now, what would you like for lunch? I haven't had breakfast yet. Then we'll eat brunch, and that can do for two meals. From then on, the day went swiftly. On Sunday morning, he came to the table ready for the cheese omelette he favoured. Jory, thank God, would eat anything. Despite myself, I thought of Chris as a father to Jory. It seemed so right to have him at the table, like it used to be, him and I playing at being parents, doing the best we could, all we could, and we have been only children ourselves. We ambled through the woods after breakfast, using all the trails I followed when I jogged. Jory rode on Chris's shoulder. We looked at the world that was just outside Foxworth Hall, all the places we hadn't been able to see when we were on the roof or locked away. Together we stood and stared at that huge mansion. Is Mama in there? he asked in a tight, thick voice. No, I've heard she's down in Texas, in one of those beauty spas for very wealthy women trying to lose fifteen extra pounds. Alerted, he swiveled his head. Who told you that? Who do you think? He shook his head violently, then lifted Jory down and set him on his feet. Damn you for playing with him, Kathy. I've seen him. He's dangerous. Leave him alone. Go back to Paul and marry him if you must have a man in your life. Let our mother live out her life in peace. You don't believe for one moment, do you, that she doesn't suffer? Do you think she can be happy knowing what she did? All the money in the world can't give her back what she's lost, and that is us. Let that be enough revenge. It isn't enough. I want to confront her in front of Bart with the truth. And you can stay one hundred years and get down on your knees and plead until your tongue falls out. I will still go ahead and do what I must. The time Chris stayed with me, he slept in the room that had been Carrie's. We did very little talking, though his eyes followed my every movement. He looked drained, lost, and most of all hurt. I wanted to tell him that when I'd finished what I had to do, I'd go back to Paul and live a safe life with him, and Jory would have the father he needed. But I said nothing. Mountain nights were cold even in September, when the days were warm still. In that attic, we'd nearly melted from the sweltering heat, and I guess this was on both our minds as we sat before the guttering log fire on the night before Chris had to leave. My son had been in bed for hours when I rose yawned, stretched wide my arms, then glanced at the clock on the mantel, which read eleven. It's time for bed, Chris, especially for you who has to get up so early tomorrow. He followed me toward Jory's room without speaking, 
and together we looked down on Jory, sleeping on his side, his dark curls damp and his face flushed. In his arms he cuddled a stuffed, plushy pony, much like the real one he said he had to have when he was four. When he's sleeping he looks more like you than Julian, whispered Chris. Paul had said the same thing. Good night, Christopher Dahl, I said as we paused by the door of Carrie's room. Sleep tight. Don't let the bedbugs bite. What I said made his face contort in pain. He turned from me, opened the door to Carrie's room, then swung back to face me. That's the way we used to say good night when we slept in the same room, he said. Then he turned and closed the door behind him. Chris was gone by the time I got up at seven o'clock. I cried a little. Jory stared at me with widened, surprised eyes. Mommy? he asked fearfully. It's all right. Mommy just misses your Uncle Chris. And Mommy is not going to work today. No, why should I? Only three students were due, and I could teach them tomorrow when the class would be full. My plans were moving too slowly. To speed them up, I asked Emma to come and stay with Jory while I jogged through the woods. I won't be gone longer than an hour. Let him play outside until lunchtime, and by then I'll be back. Dressed in a bright blue jogging outfit trimmed with white, I set off down the dirt trails. This time I used a right fork I'd never tried before, and into a denser pine forest I ran. The trail was faint and jaggedly crooked, so I had to keep a keen eye on the ground for tree roots that might trip me up. The mountain trees that grew between the pines were a brilliant blaze of fall colours, like fire against the emerald green of the pines, firs and spruces. And it was, as I told myself long ago, the year's last passionate love affair before it grew old and died from the frosty bite of winter. Someone was jogging behind me. I didn't turn to look. The crispy crackle of the dead leaves pleased my ears, so I ran faster, faster, letting the wind take my loose hair, just as I let the beauty of the day take my grief, remorse, shame and guilt and make them transparent shadows that didn't hold up beneath the sun. Kathy, hold up, called a man's strong voice. You run too fast. It was Bart Winslow, of course, as it had to be sooner or later. Fate couldn't always outwit me, and my mother couldn't always win. I threw a glance over my shoulder, smiling to see him panting as he ran in his stylish jogging costume of maple sugar tan trimmed with bands of orange and yellow knit at the cuffs, neck and waistband. Two vertical lines of yellow and orange ran down the sides of the loose pants, just what a local runner should wear when on the prowl. Hello, Mr. Winslow, I called back as I speeded up. He took the challenge and put more speed into his long legs, and I really had to put out to keep ahead. I flew, my long hair bannering behind. Squirrels on the ground, scrounging around for nuts, had to scamper to get out of my way. I laughed with the power I felt, then threw out my arms and pirouetted, feeling I was on stage, playing out the best role of my life. Then, from nowhere, a knobby tree root caught beneath the toe of my dirty sneaker, and down I fell flat on my face. Luckily, the dead leaves cushioned me. In a flash, I was up and running again, but my fall had given Bart the chance to draw nearer. Panting, gasping, clearly indicating he didn't have nearly the stamina I had, despite the advantage of his longer legs, he cried out again, Stop running, Kathy! Have mercy! This is killing me! There are other ways I can prove my manhood! I had no mercy. It was, Catch me if you can, or else I'd never be taken. I shouted this back to him and ran on, rejoicing in my powerful dancer's legs, my supple long muscles, and all that ballet training had done to make me feel a blue streak of light. No sooner did this self-conceit flash through my mind than my stupid knee suddenly gave way, and down I went again on my face in the dead leaves. And this time I was hurt, really hurt. Had I broken a bone? It was my stupid knee. If I bump my elbow on the shower door, my right knee hurts. When I have a headache, my knee hurts along with it to keep it company. Once I had a tooth filled, and the dentist was careless enough to let the drill slip and cut my gum, and my right knee shot right out and kicked him in the stomach. You're kidding. 
I'm serious. Don't you have anything peculiar about your physical makeup? Nothing I'm going to speak of. He smiled, and the devil made his dark eyes sparkle. Then he assisted me to my feet and felt my knee as if he knew what he was doing. Seems a good functional knee to me. How would you know? My knees are functionally good, so I know one when I feel one. But if I could see the knee, I could tell more. Go home and look at your wife's functional knee. Why are you being so hateful to me? He narrowed his eyes. Here I was, delighted to see you again, and you act so antagonistic. Pain always makes me antagonistic. Are you any different? I'm sweet and humble when I'm suffering, which isn't often. You get more attention that way. And remember, you threw down the challenge, not me. You didn't have to accept it. You could have gone along your merry way and let me go along mine. Now we're arguing, he said, disappointed. You want to fight when I want to be friendly. Be nice to me. Say you're glad to see me. Tell me how much better looking I've grown since you saw me last and how exciting you find me. Even if I don't run like the wind, I have my own bag of tricks. I'll bet you do. My wife is still in that beauty spa, and I've been all by my lonesome for long, long months, bored to death by living with an old lady who can't talk and can't walk, but manages to scowl every time she sees me. One evening I was just sitting before the fire, wishing someone around here would commit murder so I'd have an interesting case for a change. It's damn frustrating to be an attorney and be surrounded by nothing but happy, normal people with no suppressed emotions to erupt suddenly. Congratulations, Bart. Before you stand someone full of aggressive resentment and mean, hateful spite, seeking revenge that will erupt. You can count on that. He thought I was joking, playing a cat-and-mouse man-and-woman game. And willingly he rose to that challenge, too, not at all suspicious of my real purpose. He looked me over good, stripping off my sapphire jogging suit with the sensual eyes of a man starving for what I could give. Why did you come to live up here near me? I laughed. Huh, arrogant, aren't you? I came to take over a dance school. Sure you did. There's New York and your hometown, wherever that is, and you come here to enjoy the winter sports as well. His eyes insinuated the kind of indoor winter sport he had in mind if I didn't. Yes, I do like all kinds of sports, inside and outside, I said innocently. Confidently, he chuckled, assuming, as all conceited men do, that already he'd scored a point in the only intimate game a man really wanted to play with women. That old lady who can't talk, does she get around at all? I asked. A little. She's my wife's mother. She speaks, but her words come out jumbled and unintelligible to anyone but my wife. You leave her there all alone. Is that safe? She's not alone. There's a private duty nurse there with her all the time and a staff of servants. He frowned as if he didn't like my questions, but I persisted. Why stay there at all, then? Why not go and have fun while the cat's away? You do have a shrewish way about you. Though I've never cared much for my mother-in-law. As she is now, I feel sorry for her. And human nature being what it is, I don't trust servants to take proper care of her without a family member in the house to keep check on what's done to keep her comfortable. She's helpless and can't rise from a chair without assistance or get out of bed unless she's lifted out. So until my wife is home again, I'm in charge to see that Mrs. Malcolm Foxworth is not abused or neglected or stolen from. An overwhelming curiosity came over me then. I wanted to know her first name, for I'd never heard it. Do you call her Mrs. Foxworth? He hadn't understood my interest in an old lady and tried to turn the conversation elsewhere, but I persisted. Olivia, that's what I call her, he said shortly. When I was first married, I tried not to speak to her at all, to try to forget she existed. Now I use her first name. I think it pleases her, but I can't be sure. Her face is of stone fixed in one expression, icy. I could picture her, unmoving but for her flintstone eyes of grey. He told me enough. Now I could make my plans just as soon as I found out one more small thing. Your wife, 
When is she due back? Why should you know? I too get lonely, Bart. I have only my small son after Emma, his babysitter, goes home. So I thought maybe some evening you might like to have dinner with us. I'll come tonight, he said immediately, his dark eyes aglow. Our schedule revolves around my son. We eat at 5.30 in the summer, but now that the days are shorter, five is dinner time. Great. Feed him at five and put him to bed. I'll be there at 7.30 for cocktails. After dinner, we can get to know each other better. He met my considering look with grave intensity, as a proper attorney should. Then, because of that look we held too long, simultaneously we both broke into laughter. And incidentally, Mr. Winslow, if you cut through the woods back of your place, you can reach mine and no one will see you, unless, of course, you make a big show of yourself. He put his palm up and nodded as if we were both conspiring. Discretion is the password, Miss Dahl. Chapter 31 The Spider and the Fly Exactly at 7.30, the door chime sounded, punched by an impatient finger, forcing me to hurry lest he waken Jory, who hadn't liked being put to bed at such an early hour. If I had taken pains to look my best, so had Bart. He strode in as if he already owned the place and me. He left behind a drift of shaving lotion with a piney forest scent, and every hair on his head was carefully in place, making me wonder if he had a thinning spot, which I'd find out for myself sooner or later. I took his coat and hung it in the hall closet, then sashayed over to the bar, where I busied myself as he sat down before the log fire I had burning. Nothing had been overlooked. I even had soft music playing. By this time I knew enough about men and the ways of pleasing them best. There wasn't a man alive who wasn't charmed by a lovely woman bustling about, eager to wait on him, pamper and wine and dine him. Name your weakness, Bart. Scotch. On the rocks? Neat. He watched my every movement, which was deliberately graceful and deft. Then, turning my back, I mixed a fruity drink for myself, lacing it lightly with vodka. And with my two little stem goblets on a silver tray, I seductively ambled his way, leaning to give him an enticing view of my braless bosom. I sat across from him and swung one leg over the other to allow the long slit of my rose-colored dress to open and expose one leg from silver sandal midway to the hip. He couldn't take his eyes off it. Sorry about the glasses, I said smoothly, well pleased with his expression. I don't have room in this cottage to unpack everything I own. Most of my crystal is in storage, and I have here only wine glasses and water goblets. Scotch is scotch, no matter how it's served. And what in the world is that thing you're sipping? By this time he'd shifted his gaze to the low V of my gown. Well, you take orange juice, freshly squeezed, a dab of lemon juice too, a dash of vodka, a bit of coconut oil, and drop in a cherry to dive after. I call it a maiden's delight. After a few minutes of conversation, we drifted to the dining table, not so far from the fireplace, to eat by candlelight. Every so often he'd drop his fork or spoon, or I would, and both of us would go for it, then laugh to see who was fastest. I was every time. He was much too distracted to spot a missing fork or spoon when a neckline opened up so obligingly. This is delicious chicken, he said, after demolishing five hours of hard labor in about ten minutes. Usually I don't like chicken. Where do you learn to prepare this dish? I told him the truth. A Russian dancer taught me. She was on tour over here, and we liked each other. She and her husband stayed with Julian and me, and we cooked together whenever we weren't dancing or shopping or touring. It took four chickens to feed four people. Now you know the nasty truth about dancers. When it comes to eating, we are not in the least dainty. That is, after a performance. Before we go on, we have to eat very lightly. He smiled and leaned across the small drop-leaf table. Candlelight was in his eyes, sparkling them devilishly. Kathy, tell me honestly why you came to live in this hick town and why you've got your heart set on me for a lover. You flatter yourself. 
I said in my most aloof manner, thinking I was very successful in appearing cool on the outside, while inside I was a web of conflicting emotions. It was almost as if I had stage fright and was in the wings waiting to go on, and this was the most important performance of my life. Then, almost magically, I felt I was on stage. I didn't have to think of how to act or what to say to charm him and make him forever mine. The script had been written a long time ago when I was fifteen and locked away upstairs. Yes, Mama, it's first act time, expertly written by someone who knew him well from all the answers to her many questions. How could I fail? After dinner, I challenged Bart to a game of chess, and he accepted. I hurried to bring out the chessboard as soon as the table was cleared and the dishes were stacked in the sink. We began to set up the two armies of medieval warriors. Exactly what I came for, he said, darting me a hard look, to play chess. I showered, shaved, and put on my best suit so I could play chess. Then he smiled, devastatingly winsome. If I win, what reward? A second game. When I win the second game, what reward? If you win two games, then comes the playoff. And don't sit there and grin at me so smugly. I was taught this game by a master. Chris, of course. After I win the playoff, what reward? He insisted. You can go home and fall asleep very satisfied with yourself. Very deliberately, he picked up the chessboard with its hand-carved ivory chessmen and put it on top of the refrigerator. He caught my hand and drew me into the living room. Put on the music, ballerina, he said softly, and let's dance. No fancy footwork, just something easy and romantic. Popular music I could listen to only on the car radio to cheer up a long, lonely drive. But when it came to spending my money on records, I bought classical or ballet. However, today I'd made a special purchase of the night was made for love. And as we danced in the dimness of the living room with only the fire for light, I was reminded of the dry and dusty attic. And Chris, why are you crying, Kathy? He asked softly, and turned my head so his cheek was smeared by my tears. I don't know, I sobbed, and I didn't. Of course you know, he said, rubbing his smooth cheek against mine as we danced on and on. You are an intriguing combination, half child, half seductress, half angel. I laughed, short and bitterly. That's what all men like to think about women, little girls they have to take care of, when I know for a fact it is the male who is more boy than man. Then say hello to the first grown-up man in your life. You're not the first arrogant, opinionated man in my life, but I'll be the last, the most important one, the one you will never forget. Oh, why did he have to say that? This was right. I was over my head with this one. Alfie, did you really think you could blackmail my wife? No, but I gave it a try. I'm a fool. I expect too much, then I'm angry because nothing ever works out the way I want. When I was young and full of hopes and aspirations, I didn't know I would get hurt so often. I think I'll get tough and won't ache again, then my fragile shell shatters, and again, symbolically, my blood is spilled with the tears I shed. I pull myself back together again, go on, convince myself there is a reason for everything, and at some point in my life it will be disclosed. And when I have what I want, I hope to God it stays long enough to let me know I have it, and it won't hurt when it goes. I don't expect it to stay. Not now. I'm like a donut, always being punched out in the middle, and constantly I go around searching for the missing piece, and on and on it goes, never ending, only beginning. You're not being honest with yourself, Bart said softly. You know better than anyone where that missing piece is, or I wouldn't be here. His voice was so low and seductive, I put my head on his shoulder as we went on dancing. You're wrong, Bart. I don't know why you're here. I don't know how to fill my days. 
when I'm teaching class and when I'm with my son, then I'm alive. But when he's in bed and I'm alone, I don't know what to do with myself. I know Jory needs a father, and when I think of his father, I realize I've always managed to do the wrong thing. I've read my reviews that rave about the potential I had, but in my personal life I've made only mistakes, so what I accomplished professionally doesn't matter at all. I stopped moving my feet and sniffled, then tried to hide my face, but he tilted it upward, then dried my tears and held his handkerchief so I could blow my nose. Then came the silence, the long, long silence. Our eyes met and clung, and my heart started a faster thumping. Your problems are all so simple, Kathy, he began. All you need is someone like me, who needs someone like you. If Jory needs a father, then I need a son. See how simply all complicated matters are solved? Too simply, I thought. When he had a wife, and I was discerning and cynical enough to know he couldn't possibly care for me enough. You have a wife you love, I said bitterly. I shoved him away. I didn't want to get him too easily, but only after long and difficult struggles against my mother, and she wasn't here to know. Men are liars too, he said flatly, with some of the zest gone from his eyes. I have a wife, and occasionally we sleep together, but the fire has gone out. I don't know her. I don't think anyone knows her. She's a bundle of secrets, wound up tight, and she won't let me inside. It's gone on so long, I don't care to be let in now. She can keep her secrets and her tears, and eat her way out of her anxieties and whatever it is that makes her wake up in the night and go and look at that damn blue album. Now she's overweight, and she's written she's just had plastic surgery, facelift, and I won't know her when she comes back, as if I ever really knew her. I panicked inside. He had to care. How could I break up a marriage that was already coming apart? I needed to feel I'd accomplished this against overwhelming odds. Go home, I said, pushing at him. Get out of my house. I don't know you well enough to even listen to your problems, and I don't believe you. I don't trust you. He laughed, mocking me, aroused by my puny efforts to push him away. His libido was fired. It flamed in his eyes as he grabbed my upper arms and drew me hard against him. Now you come off it. Look at the way you're dressed. You have me come here for a reason, so here I am, ready to be seduced. You seduced me the first time I saw you. And for the life of me, it seems I've known you much longer than I actually have. Nobody plays games with me, then calls it a draw. You win or I win. But if we go to bed together, we might wake up in the morning and find out we both won. Red lights flashed. Stop. Resist. Fight. I did none of those things. I beat on his chest with ineffectual small fists, and he laughed and picked me up and threw me over his shoulder. With one hand he gripped both of my legs to keep them from kicking, and with the other he turned out the lamps. In the dark, with me still beating on his back, he carried me into my bedroom and threw me down on the coverlet. I scrambled to get up, but he came at me fast. There wasn't a chance to use the knee I had ready. He sensed my dancer's ability could defeat him, so he lunged, caught me about the waist, so we both tumbled to the floor. I opened my mouth to scream. He clamped his hand upon my open lips, then pinioned my arms with his iron strength and sat on the legs that tried to kick myself free. Kathy, my lovely seductress, you went to such a lot of trouble. You seduced me long ago, ballerina. Until the week before Christmas, you are mine. And then my wife will be home, and I won't need you. His hand eased away from my lips, and I thought I would scream, but instead I bit out, At least I didn't have to buy you with my father's millions. That did it. He crushed his lips brutally hard down on mine before I realized what was happening. This wasn't the way I wanted it. I wanted to tempt him, set him on fire, make him chase me, and give in only after a long and arduous pursuit that my mother could watch and suffer through, knowing she could do nothing or I'd talk. And yet he was taking me 
heartlessly more ruthless than Julian at his worst. Savagely, he bore down on me. He squirmed and writhed to grind in, even as his hands ripped and tore off my clinging rose dress. All I had on then was pantyhose, and soon he had those pulled down so my silver slippers came off and stayed inside of them. With his lips still crushed brutally hard on mine, he carried my resisting hand to his zipper and squeezed until my knuckles cracked. It was either tug it down or have my fingers broken. How he managed to wiggle out of his clothes, even as he held me naked beneath him, I'll never know. When he was naked but for his socks, I kept on wiggling, riding, squirming, butting, and trying to scratch or bite, while he kissed, fondled, and explored. I had my chance to scream several times, but I too was breathing fast and hard and jerking upward to force him off. But he took this as a welcoming arch of invitation. He entered and had his too quick satisfaction, then pulled out before I had any. Get out of here, I screamed. I'm calling the police. I'll have you thrown in jail, charged with assault and rape. He laughed scornfully, chucked me under the chin playfully, then stood up to pull on his clothes. Oh, he said, mocking me with an imitation of my own voice. I am so frightened. Then his voice was deeply earnest. You aren't happy, are you? It didn't work out the way you planned it. Don't you worry. Tomorrow night I'll be back. And maybe then you can please me enough so I'll feel like taking the time to please you. I've got a gun. I didn't. And if you dare set foot in this house again, you're a dead man. Not that you are a man. You are more brute than human. My wife often says the same thing, he said casually, zipping up his trousers shamelessly without the decency to even turn his back. But she likes it just the same, just as you did. Beef Wellington. You can have that tomorrow night, plus a tossed salad and a chocolate mousse for dessert. If you make me fat, we can burn off the calories in the most pleasant way possible. And I don't mean jogging. He grinned, saluted me, put one foot behind the other to turn smartly military fashion, then paused at the doorway as I sat up and clutched the remnants of my gown to my breasts. Same time tomorrow night, and I'll stay the night. That is, if you treat me right. He left and slammed the front door behind him, damn him to hell. I began to cry, not from pity for myself. It was frustration so huge I could have torn him limb from limb. Beef Wellington, I'd lace it with arsenic. A small timid sound came from outside my door. Mommy, I'm scared. Are you crying, Mommy? Hastily I pulled on a robe and called him in and held him close in my arms. Darling, darling, Mommy is all right. You had a bad dream. Mommy isn't crying, see? I brushed away the tears, for I'd get even. Three dozen red roses arrived while Jory and I were eating breakfast, the long stem variety from the florist. A small white card read, I'm sending you a big bouquet of roses, one for every night you'll have my heart. No name. And what the devil was I supposed to do with three dozen roses in a matchbox house? I couldn't send them to a children's ward. The hospital was miles and miles away. Jory decided what to do with them. Oh, Mummy, how pretty. Uncle Paul's roses. For Jory, I kept the roses instead of throwing them out, and in many vases I scattered them throughout the house. He was delighted, and when I took him with me to dancing school, he told all my students roses were all over his home, even in the bathroom. After lunch, I drove Jory to the nursery school he so loved. It was a Montessori school that was inspiring him to want to learn by appealing to his senses. Already he could print his name, and he was only three. He was like Chris, I told myself, brilliant, handsome, talented. Oh, my, Jory had everything but a father. From his bright blue eyes shone the quick intelligence of someone who would have a lifetime curiosity about everything. Jory, I love you. I know that, Mummy. He waved goodbye as I drove off. I was there to meet him when he came from his school, 
his small face flushed and troubled. Mommy, he said as soon as he was beside me in the car. Johnny Stoneman, he said his mommy slapped him when he touched her. There. And he shyly pointed at my breast. You don't slap me when I touch you there. But you don't touch me there. Not since you were a little baby and Mommy nursed you for a short while. Did you slap me then? He looked so worried. No, of course not. Babies are meant to suckle their mother's breasts. And I would never slap you for touching there. So if you want to try me, go ahead and touch. His small hand reached out tentatively while he watched my face to see if I'd be shocked. Oh, how fast the young learned all the taboos. And when he touched and God's lightning hadn't struck him down, he smiled, very relieved. Oh, it's just a soft place. He'd made a pleasant discovery, and around my neck he threw his arms. I love you too, Mommy, because you love me even when I'm bad. I'll always love you, Jory, and if you're bad, sometimes I'll try and understand. Yes, I was not going to be like my grandmother, nor my mother. I was going to be the perfect mother, and someday he'd have a father, too. How was it that little children, such young ones, would already be talking of sin and being slapped for only touching? Was it because it was too high here, too near God's eyes, so that everyone lived under his spell, living, afraid, acting righteous, while they committed every sin in the book? Honor thy father and thy mother. Do unto others as thou wouldst have done unto you. An eye for an eye. Yes, an eye for an eye. That's why I was here. I stopped to buy stamps before I reached my cottage and left Jory dozing on the front seat. He was in the post office, which was no larger than my living room, buying stamps too. Charmingly, he smiled at me as if nothing untoward had happened between us the night before. He even had the nerve to follow me to my car so he could ask how I liked the roses. Not your kind of roses, I snapped, then got primly into my car and slammed the door in his face. I left him staring after me without a smile. In fact, he looked rather miserable. At 5.30, a special delivery man brought a small package to our front door. It was certified, so I had to sign for it. Inside a large box was another box, and inside of that was a velvet jewellery case, which I quickly opened while Jory watched all eyes. On black velvet lay a single rose comprised of many diamonds, also a card with a note that read, Perhaps this kind of rose is more to your liking. I put the thing away as a trifle bought with her money, so it wasn't really from him, no more than the real roses. He had the nerve to come that night at 7.30, just as he'd said he would. Nevertheless, I readily let him in, then led him silently to the dining table with no to-do about cocktails or other niceties. The table was set even more elaborately than the night before. I'd hauled out some boxes and done some unpacking, and on the table were my best lace mats and covered silver serving dishes. Neither of us had as yet spoken. All his forgive-me roses I gathered together, and they were in the box near his plate. On his empty plate was the jeweler's velvet container with the diamond rose brooch inside. I sat to watch his expression as he put the jewellery box aside casually, and just as casually moved the flower box out of the way. He then took from his breast pocket a folded note that he handed to me. He'd written in a bold hand... I love you for reasons that have no beginning and no ending. I loved you even before I knew you, so that my love is without reason or design. Tell me to go, and I will. But know first, if you turn me away, I will remember all my life that love that should have been ours. And when I'm stretched out cold, I will but love you better after death. I glanced upward to meet his eyes squarely for the first time since he'd entered. Your poetry, it somehow has a familiar ring, with a bit of strangeness. I composed it only a few minutes ago. How could it sound familiar? He reached for the domed silver lid, ostensibly hiding the beef wellington underneath. I warned you I was an attorney, not a poet, 
so that accounts for the strangeness. Poetry was not my best subject in school. Obviously, I was very interested in his expression. Elizabeth Barrett Browning is sweet, but not your type. I did my best, he said with a wicked grin, meeting my eyes and challenging me before his gaze lowered to stare at the huge platter that held one hot dog and a small dab of cold canned beans. The disbelief in his eyes, his utter offended shock, gave me so much satisfaction I almost liked him. You are now gazing upon Jory's favourite menu, I said, gloating. It is exactly what he and I ate tonight for dinner, and since it was good enough for us, I thought it was good enough for you, so I saved some. Since I've already eaten, all of that is yours alone, and you may help yourself. Scowling, he flashed me a burning, hard look, then savagely bit down into the hot dog, which I'm sure had grown cold as the beans. But he gobbled down everything and drank his glass of milk, and for dessert I handed him a box of animal crackers. First he stared at the box in another expression of dumbfounded amazement, then ripped it open, seized up a lion, and snapped off the head in one bite. Only when he'd eaten every animal cracker and then picked up each crumb did he take the trouble to look at me. With so much disapproval I should have shrunken to ant size. I take it you are one of those despicable liberated women who refuses to do anything to please a man. Wrong. I am liberated only with some men. Others I can worship, adore, and wait on like a slave. You made me do what I did, he objected strongly. Do you think I planned it that way? I wanted us to find our relationship on an equal basis. Why did you wear that kind of dress? It's the kind all chauvinist men prefer. I am not a chauvinist, and I hate that kind of dress. You like what I've got on better? I sat up straighter to give him a better view of the old nappy sweater I had on. With it, I wore faded blue jeans with dirty sneakers on my feet, and my hair was skin back and fastened in a granny's knot. Deliberately, I'd pulled long strands free so they hung loose about my face, slovenly fringes to make me look more appealing, and no makeup prettied my face. He was dressed to kill. At least you look honest and ready to let me do the pursuing. If there is one thing I despise, it's women who come on strong like you did last night. I expected better from you than that kind of sleazy dress that showed everything to take the thrill from discovering for myself. He knitted his brows and mumbled, I'm a damned harlot's red dress to blue jeans. In the course of one day, she changes into a teeny bopper. It was rose-coloured, not red. And besides, Bart, strong men like you always adore weak and passive, stupid women, because basically you're meek yourself and afraid of an aggressive woman. I am not weak or meek or anything, but a man who likes to feel a man not to be used for your own purposes. And as for passive women, I despise them as much as I do aggressive ones. I just don't like the feeling of being the victim of a huntress leading me into a trap. The hell are you trying to do to me? Why dislike me so much? I sent you roses, diamonds, imitation poetry, and you can't even comb your hair and take the shine from your nose. You are looking at the natural me, and now that you've seen, you can leave. I got up and walked to the front door and swung it open. We are wrong for each other go back to your wife. She can have you, for I don't want you. He came quickly as if to obey, then seized me in his arms and kicked the door closed. I love you. God knows why I do, but it seems I've always loved you. I stared up in his face, disbelieving him, even as he took the pins from my hair and let it spill down. Out of long habit, I tossed it about so it fluffed out and arranged itself and smiling a little, he tilted my face to his. May I kiss your natural lips? They are very beautiful lips. Without waiting for permission, he brushed his lips gently over mine. Oh, the shivery sensation of such a feathery kiss. Why didn't all men know that was the right way to start? What woman wanted to be eaten alive, choked by a thrusting tongue? Not me. 
I wanted to be played like a violin, strummed pianissimo in largo timing, fingered into legato and let it grow into crescendo. Deliciously, I wanted to head toward the ecstatic heights that could only happen for me when the right words were spoken and the right kind of kisses given before his hands came into play. If he'd done for me only a little last night, this night he used all the skills he had. This time he took me to the stars where we both exploded, still holding tight to each other and doomed to do it again and then again. He was hairy all over. Julian had been hairless, but for one thatch that grew in a thin line up to his navel. And Julian had never kissed my feet. It smelled of roses from a long, perfumed bath before I put on old work clothes. Toe by toe he mouthed before he started working upwards. I felt the grandmother watching, blazing her hard grey eyes to put us both in hell. I turned off my mind, shut her out, and gave in to my senses and to this man who was now treating me like a lover. But he didn't love me, I knew that. Bart was using me as a substitute for his wife, and when she came back I'd never see him again. I knew it, knew it. But still I took and I gave until we fell asleep in each other's arms. When I slept, I dreamed. Julian was in the silver music box my father had given me when I was six. Round and round he spun, his face ever turning toward me, accusing me with his jet eyes. And then he grew a moustache and was Paul, who only looked sad. I ran fast to set him free from death in a music box turned into a coffin. And then it was Chris inside, his eyes closed, his hands folded one over the other on his chest. Dead. Dead. Chris. I awoke to find Bart gone and my pillow wet with tears. Mama, why did you start this? Why? Holding tight to my son's small hand, I led him out into the cold morning air on my way to work. Faint and far away, I heard someone calling my name, and with it came the scent of old-fashioned roses. Why don't you come, Paul, and save me from myself? Why only call in your thoughts? Part one was done. Part two would begin when my mother knew I had Bart's child. And then there was the grandmother who had to pay as well. And when I looked, I saw that the mountains curved upward into a satisfied smirk. At last I had responded to their call, their vengeful, tormenting wail. Chapter 32 the grandmother revisited. Foxworth Hall was at the end of a cul-de-sac, the largest and most impressive of many fine large homes, and the only one that sat high, high on the hillside, looking down on all the others like a castle. For days I went to stare at it, making my plans. Bart and I didn't have to sneak around furtively to meet. The houses where he lived were far apart, and no one could see us when he came to me through the back door that opened out into the yard with a fence. In back of that was a country lane, shrubbed and made private by many trees. Sometimes we met in a distant town, and our lovemaking in a motel room was wild, sweet, tender, erotic, and altogether satisfying. And yet I froze when he told me at lunch, She called this morning, Kathy. She'll be home before Christmas. That's nice, I said, and went right on eating my salad and anticipating the beef wellington that would show up soon. He frowned, and his fork loaded with salad hesitated on the way to his mouth. It means we won't be able to see as much of each other. Aren't you sorry? We'll find ways. You aren't the damnedest woman. Don't get so worked up over nothing. All women are monsters to men and maybe to ourselves. We are our own worst enemies. You don't have to divorce her and give up your chance to inherit her fortune, though she could outlive you and have the chance to buy another, younger husband. Sometimes you are just as bitchy as she is. She did not buy me. I loved her. She loved me. 
I was crazy about her. As crazy for her as I am for you now. But she changed. When I met her, she was sweet, charming, everything I wanted in a woman and wife. But she changed. He stabbed the salad fork toward his mouth and chewed viciously. He's always been a mystery, like you. Bart, my love, I said, very soon all mystery walls will crumble. He went on as if I hadn't interrupted. That father of hers, he too was a mystery. You'd look at him and see a fine old gentleman, but underneath was a heart of steel. I thought I was his only attorney, but he had six others, each of us assigned to different tasks. Mine was to make out his wills. He changed them dozens of times, putting this family member in and writing another out and adding codicils like a madman. Oh, he was sane enough right up until the very end. The last codicil was the worst. Of course, no children for him ever. Then you really were a practicing lawyer. He smiled bitterly, then answered, Of course I was. And now I am again. A man needs something meaningful to do. How many times can anyone tour Europe before boredom sets in? You see the same old faces doing the same old things, laughing at the same jokes. The beautiful people. What a laugh. Too much money buys everything but health. Though they have no dreams left to purchase and no aspirations, so in the end they are only bored. Why don't you divorce her and do something meaningful with your life? She loves me. That's the way he said it, short, sweet. He stayed because she loved him, forcing me to say, You told me when we first met that you loved her, and then you say you don't. Which is it? He thought about it for a long time. Honestly, ballerina, I'm ambivalent and resentful. I love her. I hate her. I thought she was what you seem to be now. So please smother that bitchy side that reminds me of her and don't try and do to me what she did. You are putting a wall between us because you know something I don't. I don't fall in love easily, and I wish I didn't love you. He seemed suddenly a small boy, wistful as if his pet dog might betray him and life would never be good again. I was touched and dared to say, Bart, I swear there will come a day when you know all my secrets and all of hers. But until that time comes, say you love me, even if you don't mean it, for I can't enjoy being with you if I don't feel you love me just a little. A little? It seems I've loved you all my life. Even when I kissed you the first time, it seemed I'd kissed you before. What is that? Karma. I smiled at his baffled expression. There was something I had to do before my mother came home. One day, when I had no classes and Jory was in his special school, I slipped over to Foxworth Hall, using all the hidden ways. At the back door, I used the old wooden key that Chris had fashioned so long ago. It was Thursday. All the servants would be in town. Since Bart had told me in detail his routine, that also told me a lot of the grandmother's daily life. I knew at this time the nurse would be napping, as my grandmother had her rest time in the afternoon, too. At the back door, I used the old wooden key that Chris had fashioned so long ago. It was Thursday. All the servants would be in town. Since Bart had told me in detail his routine, that also told me a lot of the grandmother's daily life. I knew at this time the nurse would be napping, as my grandmother had her rest time in the afternoon, too. She'd be in the same little room beyond the library, the same room that had confined our grandfather during his last days, while upstairs we four children waited for him to pass on to his rewards, and death would set us free. I strolled through all those rich grand rooms and hungrily stared at all the fine furnishings and saw again the dual winding staircases in the front foyer large enough to be used as a ballroom. Where the curving staircases met was a balcony on the second floor, and from that rose another flight of stairs straight up to the attic. 
I saw the massive chest where Chris and I had hidden inside to watch a Christmas party going on below. So long ago, and yet my clock of time turned swiftly backward. I was twelve again, and scared, afraid this mammoth house would swallow me down if I moved or spoke above a whisper. I was awed again by the three giant crystal chandeliers suspended from a ceiling some forty feet above the floor. And because it was a dance floor of mosaic tiles, I automatically had to dance just a little to see how it felt. I ambled on, taking my time, admiring the paintings, the marble busts, the huge lamps, the fabulous wall hangings that only the super-rich, who could be so stingy in small ways, could buy. Imagine my grandmother buying bolts of grey taffeta just to save a few dollars when they bought the best to furnish their rooms and they had millions. The library was easy to find. Lessons learned at an early age and under miserable conditions could never be forgotten. Oh, such a library. Claremont didn't have a library with so many fine books. Bart's photograph was on the ponderous desk that had been my grandfather's. Many things were there to indicate that Bart often used this room for his study and to keep his mother-in-law company. His brown house slippers were beneath a comfortable-looking chair near the immense stone fireplace with a mantle twenty feet long. French doors opened onto a terrace facing a formal garden with a fountain to spray water into a bird bath formed by a rock garden of steps with the water trickling down into a pool. A nice, sunny place for an invalid to sit, protected from the wind. At last I'd seen enough to satisfy my curiosity harboured for years, and I sought out the heavy door at the far end of the library. Beyond that closed door was the witch-grandmother. Visions of her flashed through my mind. I saw her again as she'd been the first night we came, towering above us, her thick body strong, powerful, her cruel hard eyes that swept over us all and showed no sympathy, no compassion for fatherless children who had lost so much and she couldn't even smile to welcome us or touch the pretty round cheeks of the twins who had been so appealing at age five. The second night flashed when the grandmother ordered our mother to show us her naked back striped with red and bleeding welts. Even before we'd seen that horror, she'd picked Carrie up by the hair and Corey had hurled himself against her trying to inflict some pain with his small white shoe that kicked her leg and his small sharp teeth that bit and with one powerful slap she'd send him reeling. All because he had to defend his beloved twin, who had screamed and screamed. Again I saw myself before the mirror in the bedroom without a stitch on, and her punishment had been so harsh, so heartless, trying to take from me what I admired the most, my hair. A whole day Chris had spent, trying to take the tar from my hair and save it from the shears. Then no food or milk for two whole weeks. Yes, she deserved to see me again, just as I'd vowed the day she whipped me that there would come a day in the future when she would be the helpless one and I would be the one to wield the whip and keep the food from her lips. Ah, the sweet irony of it, that she would gloat to see her husband dead, and now she was in his bed and even more helpless and alone. I took off my heavy winter coat, sat down to tug off my boots, and then I put on the white satin points. My leotards were white and sheer enough to let the pink of my skin show through. I unbound my hair so it fell in a luxuriant golden cascade of rippling waves down my back. Now she would see and envy the hair the tar hadn't ruined after all. Get ready, Grandmother. Here I come. Very quietly I stole to her door, then carefully I eased it open. She was on the high, high hospital bed, her eyes half closed. The sun through the windows fell upon her pink and shining scalp, clearly revealing how nearly bald she was. And oh, how old she looked! So gaunt, so much smaller. Where was the giantess I used to know? Why wasn't she wearing a grey taffeta dress to whisper threats? Why did she have to look so pitiful? I hardened my heart closed out Mercy, for she'd never had any for us. Apparently she was on the verge of sleep, but as the door opened slowly, slowly her eyes widened. Then her eyes bulged. She recognized me. Her thin, shriveled lips quivered. 
She was afraid. Glory, hallelujah. My time had come. Still, I paused in the open doorway, appalled. I had come for revenge, and time had robbed me. Why wasn't she the monster I recalled? I wanted her that way, not what she was now. An old, sick woman with her hair so scant most of her scalp showed, and the hair left was pulled to the top of her head and fastened up there by a pink satin ribbon bow. The bow gave her a ghoulish, girlish look, and even bunched together as they were, the thin wisps were no wider than my small finger, just a tuft like a worn-out, bleached brush for watercolour painting. Once she'd stood six feet tall and weighed over two hundred pounds, and her huge breasts had been mountains of concrete. Now those breasts hung like old socks to reach her puffy abdomen. Her arms were withered old dry sticks, her hands corded, her fingers gnarled. Yet as I stared, and she stared in complete silence, as a small clock ticked relentlessly on, her old despicable personality flared hot to let me know her outrage. She tried to speak to order me out. Devil's issue, she'd scream if she could. Get out of my house, devil's spawn, out, out, out. But she couldn't say it, any of it. While I could greet her pleasantly. Good afternoon, dear grandmother. How very nice to see you again. Remember me? I'm Kathy, one of the grandchildren you helped hide away, and each day you brought us food in a picnic basket. Every day by 6.30 you were there with your gallon thermos of milk and your quart thermos of lukewarm soup, and canned soup at that. Why couldn't you have brought us hot soup at least once? Did you deliberately heat that soup to only warm? I stepped inside and closed the door behind me, and only then did she see the willow switch I'd hidden behind my back. Casually, I tapped the switch on my palm. Grandmother, I said softly, remember the day you whipped our mother? How you forced her to strip in front of her father and then you whipped her? And she was an adult. A shameless, wicked, evil deed, don't you agree? Her terrified grey eyes fixed on the switch. A terrible struggle was going on in her brain, and I was glad, so glad, Bart had told me she wasn't senile. Pale, watery grey eyes, red-rimmed and crinkled all about with deep crow's feet, like cuts that never bled. Thin, crooked lips, now shrunken to only a tiny buttonhole, and puckered about by a radiating sunburst of deep lines, etching beneath her long, hooked nose a spiderweb design of cross-hatch lines. And believe it or not, to the high and severe neckline of that yellow cotton jacket was fastened the diamond brooch. Never had I seen her without the brooch pinned to the neckline of her grey taffeta dresses with the white crocheted collars. Grandmother, I chanted, remember the twins? The dear little five-year-olds you enticed into this house? And not once while they were here did you ever speak their names, or any of our names. Corey's dead, and you know that. But did my mother tell you about Carrie? Carrie is dead, too. She didn't grow very tall, because she was robbed of sunlight and fresh air in the years when she needed it most. Robbed, too, of love and security, and given trauma instead of happiness. Chris and I went onto the roof to sit and sun ourselves, but the twins were afraid of the high roof. Did you know we went out there and we'd stay for hours and hours? No, you didn't know, did you? She moved a bit, as if trying to shrink into the thin mattress. I gloated to see her fear, rejoiced that she could move a little. Her eyes now were as mine used to be, window panes to reveal all her terrified emotions, and she couldn't cry out for help. At my mercy. Remember the second night, dearest, loving grandmother? You lifted Carrie up by her hair, and you must have known that hurt, yet you did it. Then you sent Corey spinning with one blow, and that hurt too, and he was only trying to protect his sister. Poor Carrie, how she grieved for Corey. She never got over his death, never stopped missing him. She met a nice boy named Alex. They fell in love and were going to be married when she found out he was going to be a minister. That shook Carrie up. You see, you made us all deeply fearful of religious people. 
The day Alex said he was going to be a minister, Carrie went into a despairing depression. She had learned the lesson you taught very well. You taught us that no one can ever be perfect enough to please God. Something dormant came to life the day Carrie was weakened by shock, depression, and the lack of the spirit to go on. Now listen to what she did because of you. Because you impressed on her young brain that she was born evil and she'd be wicked no matter how much she sought to be good. She believed you. Corey was dead. She knew he had died from the arsenic put on sugar doughnuts. So when she felt she could no longer put up with life and all the people who expected perfection, she bought rat poison. She bought a package of twelve doughnuts and coated them with that rat poison full of arsenic. She ate all but one, and that had a bite mark. Now, shrink into your mattress and try and run from the guilt that is yours. You and my mother killed her as much as you killed Corey. I despise you, old woman. I didn't tell her I hated my mother more. The grandmother had never loved us, so anything she did was to be expected. But our mother, who had borne us, who had cared for us, who had loved us well when Daddy lived, that was another story. An unbearable horror story, and her time would come. Yes, Grandmother. Carrie is dead now, too, because she wanted to die in the same way Corey had and be with him in heaven. Her eyes squinched, and a small shudder rippled the covers. I gloated. I brought from behind my back the box containing a long length of Carrie's hair that had taken me hours to arrange and brush into one long, shimmering switch of molten gold. At one end it was tied with a red satin bow, and at the other a bow of purple satin. Look, old woman, this is Carrie's hair, some of it. I have another box full of loose, tangled strands, for I can't bear to part with a piece of it. I saved it to keep, not only for Chris and myself, but to show you and our mother, for the two of you killed Carrie as surely as you killed Corey. Oh, I was near mad with hate. Revenge blazed my eyes, my temper, and shook my hands. I could see Carrie as she lay near death, turning old, withered, bony, until she was only a little skeleton covered by loose, pale skin, so translucent all her veins showed, and the remains had to be sealed quickly in a box of pretty metal to shut away the stench of decay. I stepped nearer the bed and dangled the bright hair with its gay ribbons before her wide and frightened eyes. Isn't this beautiful hair, old woman? Was yours ever so beautiful, so bountiful? No, I know it wasn't. Nothing about you could ever have been pretty, nothing, not even when you were young. That's why you were so jealous of your husband's stepmother. I laughed to see her flinch. Yes, dear grandmother, I know a lot more about you now than I did. Your son-in-law has told me all the family secrets my mother told him. Your husband, Malcolm, was in love with his father's younger wife, ten times more beautiful and sweeter than you ever were. So when Alicia had a son, you suspected that child was your own husband's. And that's why you hated our father and why you sent for him, deceiving him into believing he'd found a good home. And you educated him and gave him the best of everything so he'd have a taste of the good, rich life and be more hurt and disappointed later on when you threw him out and left him nothing in your wills. My father fooled you instead, didn't he? He stole your only daughter, whom you hated too, because her father loved her more than he loved you. And half-uncle married half-niece. Yet how wrong you were about Malcolm and Alicia, for my father's mother despised Malcolm. She fought him off time and again, and the baby she had was not your husband's son. Though he would have been if Malcolm had had his way. Blankly, she stared at me as if the past was of no importance to her now. Only the present mattered, and the switch in my hand. I'm going to tell you something now, old woman, that you need to know. There was never a better man born than my father, or a more honorable woman than his mother. But don't lie there and think I've inherited any of Alicia's or my father's godly traits, for I am like you, heartless. I never forget, never forgive. I hate you for killing Corey and Carrie. I hate you for making of me what I am. I screamed this out of control, forgetful of the nurse napping down the hall. 
I wanted to feed her arsenic by the handfuls and sit to watch her die and rot before my eyes like Carrie had. I pirouetted around the room to release my frustrations, lashing my legs, showing off my fine young body. Then I drew up short and snapped in her face. All those years you locked us up, you never said our names, never looked at Chris because he was our father all over again. And your husband, too, when he was young and before you made him evil, too. You blame everything wrong with human beings on their evil souls and ignore the truth. Money is the god who rules in this house. It's money that's always made the worst things happen. You were married for your money and you knew it. And greed brought us here and greed locked us up and stole three years and four months from our lives and put us at your mercy. And you didn't have any. Not even for your grandchildren. The only grandchildren you'd ever have. And we never touched you, did we? Though we tried in the beginning, remember? I jumped up on the bed and lashed at her with the length of Carrie's golden hair. A soft whip that didn't hurt, though she cringed from the touch. Then I tossed Carrie's precious hair to her bedside table and snapped the switch before her eyes. I danced and whirled on her bed over her frozen body, displaying my fine agility as my long hair flared in a golden circle. Remember how you punished our mother before we grew to hate her too? I owe you for that, I said, legs apart and straddling her covered body. From your neck down to your heels, I owe you that. Plus the whip lashes you gave Chris and me, I owe you that too. And all the other things, each one of them is etched in my memory. Didn't I tell you there would come a day when I held the switch in my hand and there would be food in the kitchen you'd never eat? Well, that day is here, Grandmother. The sunken grey eyes in her gaunt face sparkled hate, malicious and strong, daring me to strike her, daring me. What shall I do first? I said as if to myself. Shall it be the switch or the hot tar in your hair? Where did you get the tar, old woman? I always wondered where you got it. Did you plan it way in advance and wait for an excuse to use it? I'm going to confess something now you don't know. Chris never cut off all my hair only the front part, to fool you into thinking I was bald-headed. Beneath that towel I wrapped on my head was all the long hair he saved. Yes, old woman, love saved my hair from being cut off. He loved me enough to work for hours and hours to save what hair he could, more love than you've ever known, and from a brother. Deep in her throat she made a strangling sound, and how I wished she could speak. "'Grandmother, darling,' I taunted, hands on my hips as I leaned to look down on her. "'Why don't you tell me where to get the tar? I haven't been able to find any. No road construction going on anywhere near. Well, I guess I'll have to use hot wax. You could have used melted wax, for it would have done the job just as well. Didn't you think of melting a few of your candles?' I smiled, menacingly, I hoped. "'Oh, dear Grandmother, what Fun you and I are going to have, and nobody will know, for you can't talk and you can't write. All you can do is lie there and suffer. I didn't like myself or what I was saying or what I was feeling. My conscience hovered near the ceiling, looking down with shame at this released fury that was me in white tights. Aghast, I was up there feeling pity for this old woman who'd suffered through two strokes. But on the bed was another kind of me, a vicious, mean, vindictive Foxworth, with blue eyes as cold as hers used to be, as I stared her down. And then suddenly, cruelly, I bent. I yanked down the sheet and blanket that covered her, and she was exposed. Her garment was like a hospital jacket that was slit and tied down the back, for there was no front opening. Just a plain yellow cotton thing with that incongruous diamond brooch at the throat. No doubt they would attach that brooch to her funeral garments. Naked. She had to be stripped, as Mama was, as Chris had been, as I had been too. She had to suffer through the humiliation of being without clothes, while contemptuous eyes made her shrivel even smaller. Relentlessly I seized hold of the hem of her stingy, cheap cotton garment, and without compunction I yanked it upward to her armpits. In rumpled, unironed folds it half hid her face, and carefully I pulled back the cloth that could hide from me any expression she might manage to reveal. 
Then I stared down at her body, expressing scorn and revulsion as she had expressed it with her hard eyes and knife-slashed lips when I was a child of fourteen, and she had caught me looking at myself in the mirror, admiring the beauty of a figure I'd never seen before nude. The body in its youth is a beautiful thing, a joy to behold, the sweet young curves, the smooth unblemished skin, firm and taut flesh, but oh, to grow old! Those twin hills of concrete were flabby, loose udders that sagged to her waist, and the nipples were at the very bottom, large, brown, mottled and bumpy. The blue veins of her breasts stood up like thin ropes covered by a translucent sheath. The pasty whiteness of her skin was dimpled, furrowed, creased by stretch marks from childbirth, and a long scar from navel to her almost hairless mound of Venus showed she'd either had a hysterectomy or a caesarean section. It was an old scar, pale and shinier than the doughy white wrinkled skin around it. Her thin long legs were gnarled old branches of a tired tree. I sighed. Would I some day look like this? Without pity or an attempt to be gentle, I rolled her over and yanked her back into the centre of the bed. And all the while I was babbling on of how Chris and I had joked she either nailed on her clothes or glued them in, and never, of course, did she take off her underclothes, unless she was in a closet with the light out. Her back showed fewer ravages than her front, though her buttocks were flat, flabby, and too white. "'I'm going to whip you now, Grandmother,' I said tonelessly. "'My heart gone out of this now. "'I promised a long time ago I was going to do this if ever I had the chance, "'and so I will do it. "'I'm closing my eyes and asking God to forgive me for what I was about to do. "'I lifted my arm high and then brought down that willow switch as hard as I could "'and flat on her bare buttocks. "'She shuddered. "'Some noise came from her throat.' Then she seemed to sink into unconsciousness. She relaxed so much she released her bladder. I began to cry. Terrible sobs from me as I ran to the adjoining bath to find a washcloth and soap, and back I hurried with toilet tissue to clean her. Then I washed her and put salve on the awful welt I'd made. I turned her over on the bed, straightened out her gown so she was covered modestly, neatly, and only then did I check to see if she was alive or dead. Her grey eyes were open and staring at me without expression, as tears streaked my face. Next, slowly, as I sobbed on, her eyes began to gleam in unspoken triumph. Mutely, she called me, coward. I knew you couldn't be anything but a soft weakling. No spine, no starch. Kill me. Go on, kill me, I dare you. Do it. Do it. Go on. Down from the bed I jumped, and I ran fast into the library and on into the parlour I'd seen. In a frenzy of anger I grabbed up the first candelabra I saw and dashed back to her, but I didn't have matches. Back again to the library where I rummaged through the desk Bart used. He smoked. He'd have matches or a cigarette lighter. I found a book of matches from a local disco. The candles were ivory-coloured, dignified like this house terror was in her iron eyes now. She wanted that bit of tufted hair tied with a pink ribbon. I lit a candle and watched it flame, then I held it angled over her head, so the melting wax dribbled down drop by drop onto her hair and her scalp. Maybe six or seven drops fell before I could stand no more. She was right. I was a coward. I couldn't do to her what she'd done to us. I was a fox worth twice over, and yet God had changed the mould so I didn't fit. I blew out the ivory candle, replaced it in the candelabra, then left. No sooner was I in the ballroom than I remembered I'd forgotten the precious length of Carrie's hair. I raced back to get it. I found the grandmother lying as I'd left her, only her head was turned, and two huge glistening tears were in her eyes that stared at the switch of Carrie's beautiful hair. Ah, now I had my pound of flesh. Bart spent more time at my small home than at his huge one. 
He plied me with gifts as he did my son. He ate his breakfast, lunch, and dinner with us on the days he didn't spend in his office, which I privately believed was more a facade for appearing useful than a functioning law office. My dancing school suffered from his attention, but it didn't matter. I was now a kept woman, paid to be his mistress. Jory was delighted with the little leather boots Bart gave him. Are you my daddy? asked my son, who would be four in February. No, but I sure wish I was, and I could be. As soon as Jory was out in the yard, tromping around and staring down at his feet that fascinated him now that they sported cowboy boots, Bart turned to me and flung himself wearily down in a chair. You'd never guess what happened over at our place. Some sadistic idiot put wax in my mother-in-law's hair. and There's a long welt on her buttocks that won't heal. The nurse can't explain it. I questioned Olivia and asked if it was anyone she knew, one of the servants, and she blinked her eyes twice, meaning no. Once is for yes. I'm mad as hell about it. It must have been one of the servants, yet I can't understand why one would be so cruel as to torment a helpless old woman who can't move to defend herself. She refuses to identify anyone I name. I promised Corinne I'd take good care of her, and now her bottom is such a raw mess she has to lie on her stomach two to four hours each day, and she is turned during the night. Oh, I breathed, feeling a bit sick. How awful! Why won't it heal? Her circulation is bad. It would have to be, wouldn't it, since she can't move about normally? He smiled then, brilliantly, like the sun coming out after a storm. Don't concern yourself, darling. It's my problem, not yours. And, of course, hers. He held out his arms, and I went quickly into them to snuggle in his lap, and he kissed fervently before he carried me into my bedroom. He laid me down and began to undress. I could wring the neck of the fiend who did that to her. We lay entwined after our lovemaking, listening to the wind blending with Jory's shrill laughter, racing after the toy poodle Bart had given him. A few snow flurries were beginning to fall. I knew I had to get up soon so Jory wouldn't run in and catch us, just to tell us it was snowing. He couldn't remember other snows, and barely would the ground be sugar-coated than he'd want to make a snowman. Sighing first, I kissed Bart, then reluctantly pulled from his embrace. I turned my back to pull on bikini panties as he propped up on an elbow and watched. You've got a lovely behind, he said. I said, thanks. What about my front? He said it wasn't bad. I threw a shoe at him. Kathy, why don't you say you love me? I whirled about, startled. Have you ever said it to me and meant it? I snapped on a tiny bra. How do you mean I don't mean it? He asked with anger. Let me tell you how I know. When you love, you want that person with you all of the time. When you avoid the subject of divorce, that alone is an indication of how much you care for me and just where I belong in your life. Kathy, you've been hurt, haven't you? I don't want to hurt you more. You play games with me. I've always known that. What does it matter if it is only sex and not love? And tell me how to know where one ends and the other begins. His teasing words were a knife in my heart, for somehow, without meaning to let it happen, I'd fallen madly, idiotically, in love with him. According to Bart's enthusiastic report, his long-gone wife came home from her rejuvenation trip looking smashingly young and beautiful. She's lost twenty pounds. I swear that facelift has done wonders. She looks sensational. And damn it, so unbelievably like you. It was easy to see how impressed he was with his new, younger-looking wife, and if he was only trying to take the wind from my too confident sails, I didn't let it show. Then he was telling me I was just as necessary to him as before, in a tone that said I was not. Kathy, while she was in Texas, she changed. She's like she used to be, the sweet, loving woman I married. Men, how gullible they were. Of course my mother was sweeter and nicer to him now, 
now that she knew he had a mistress who was very accessible and that the other woman was her own daughter. She'd have to know, for it was whispered all about now. Everyone knew. So, why are you here with me when your wife is back and so like me? Why don't you put your clothes on and say goodbye and never come back? Say it was sweet while it lasted, but it's all over now, and I'll say thank you for a wonderful time before I kiss you farewell. Well, he drawled, pulling me hard against his naked body. I didn't say she was that sensational looking. And then again, there is something special about you. I can't name it. I can't understand it. But I don't know if I can live without you now. He said it seriously, truth in his dark eyes. I'd won. Won. Quite by accident, my mother and I met in the post office one day. She saw me and shivered. Her lovely head lifted higher as she turned it slightly away, pretending she didn't know me. She would deny me as she denied Carrie, even though it was so obvious that we were mother and daughter and not strangers. I wasn't Carrie, so I treated her as she treated me, indifferently, as if she were nobody special and never would be again. Yet as I waited impatiently for my roll of stamps, I saw my mother dart her eyes to follow the restless prowl of my young son, who had to stare at everything and everyone. He was handsome, graceful, a charming boy who drew the eyes of everyone, who had to stop and admire him and pat his head. Jory moved with innate style, unstudied and relaxed, at ease wherever he was because he thought the whole world was his and he was loved by everyone. He turned to catch my mother's long stare, and he smiled. Hello, he greeted. You're pretty, like my mommy. Oh, the things children say. What innocent knowledge they had to see so readily what others instinctively refused to acknowledge. He stepped closer to reach out and tentatively touch her fur coat. My mommy's got a fur coat. My mommy is a dancer. Do you dance? She sighed. I held my breath. See, Mama, there is the grandson your arms will never hold. You'll never hear him say your name. Never. No, she whispered. I'm not a dancer. Tears filmed her eyes. My mommy can teach you how. I'm too old to learn, she whispered, backing off. No, you're not said Jory, reaching for her hand as if he'd show her the way. But she pulled back, glanced at me, reddened, then fumbled in her purse for a handkerchief. Do you have a little boy I can play with? questioned my son, concerned to see her tears, as if having a son would make up for not knowing how to dance. No, she said in a quivering, weak whisper. I don't have any children. That's when I moved in to say in a cold, harsh voice, Some women don't deserve to have children. I paid for my roll of stamps and dropped them in my purse. Some women, like you, Mrs. Winslow, would rather have money than the bother of children who might get in the way of good times. Time itself will, sooner or later, let you know if you made the right decision. She turned her back and shivered again as if all her furs couldn't keep her warm enough. Then she strode from the post office and headed toward a chauffeur-driven black limousine. Like a queen, she rode off, head held high, leaving Jory to ask, Mommy, why don't you like that pretty lady? I like her a lot. She's like you, only not so pretty. I didn't comment, though it was on the tip of my tongue to say something so ugly he would never forget it. In the twilight of that evening, I sat near the windows, staring toward Foxworth Hall and wondering what Bart and my mother were doing. My hands were on my abdomen, which was still flat, but soon it would be swelling with the child that might be started. One missed period didn't prove anything, except I wanted Bart's baby, and little things made me feel sure there was a baby. I let depression come and take me. He wouldn't leave her and have money to marry me, and I'd have another fatherless child. What a fool to start all of this. 
but I'd always been a fool. And then I saw a man slipping through the woods, coming to me, and I laughed, made confident again. He loved me, he did, and as soon as I knew for certain, I would tell him he was to be a father. Then the wind came in with Bart and blew the vase of roses from the table. I stood and stared down at the crystal pieces and the petals scattered about. Why was the wind always trying to tell me something, something I didn't want to hear? Chapter 33 Stacking the Deck Kathy, you told me there was no need for precautions. There was no need. I want your baby. You want my baby? What the hell do you think I can do, marry you? No. I did my own assuming. I presumed you'd have your fun with me, and when it was over you'd go back to your wife and find yourself another playmate. And I'd have just what I set out to get, your baby. Now I can leave. So kiss me off, Bart, as just another of your little extramarital dalliances. He looked furious. We were in my living room while a fierce blizzard raged outside. Snow heaped in mounds window high, and I was before the fireplace knitting a baby bunting before I began a booty. I was getting ready to slip a stitch, then knit two together, when Bart seized my knitting from my hands and hurled it away. It's unraveling, I cried in dismay. What the hell are you trying to do to me, Kathy? You know I can't marry you. I never lied and said I would. You're playing a game with me. He choked and covered his face with his hands, then took them down and pleaded, I love you. God help me, but I do. I want you near me always, and I want my child, too. What kind of game are you playing now? Just a woman's game, the only game she can play and be sure of winning. Look, he said, trying to regain his control of the situation. Explain what you mean. Don't double talk. Nothing has to change because my wife is back. You'll always have a place in my life. In your life? Don't you mean more correctly on the fringes of your life? For the first time, I heard humility in his voice. Kathy, be reasonable. I love you, and I love my wife, too. Sometimes I can't separate you from her. She came back different, as I told you, and now she is like she was when we first met. Maybe a more youthful figure and face has given her back some confidence she lost, and because of it she can be sweeter. Whatever the cause, I'm grateful. Even when I disliked her, I loved her. When she was hateful, I'd try and strike back by going to other women, but still I loved her. The one big issue we fight over is her unwillingness to have a child, even an adopted one. Of course, she's too old to have one now. Please, Kathy, stay. Don't leave. Don't take my child away so I will never know what happens to him or to her. Or to you. I laid it out flat. All right. I will stay on one condition. If you divorce her and marry me, only then will you have the child you always wanted. Otherwise, I'm taking myself, and that means your child too far away. Maybe I'll write to let you know if you have a son or a daughter, and maybe I won't. Either way, once I leave, you are out of my life for good. I thought, look at him, acting as if that codicil weren't in the will forbidding his wife to have children, protecting her, just like Chris, when all along he had to know, he'd drawn up the will he had to know. Before the fireplace he stood with his arm up on the mantel, then he rested his forehead on that and stared down at the fire. His free hand was behind his back and clenched into a fist. His confused thoughts were so deep they reached out and touched me with pity. He turned then to face me, staring deep into my eyes. My God, he said, shocked by his discovery. You planned this all along, didn't you? You came here to accomplish what you have. But why? Why should you choose me to hurt? What have I ever done to you, Kathy, but love you? True, it started with sex, and sex only was what I wanted it to stay. But it has grown into something much more than that. 
I like being with you. Just sitting and talking or walking in the woods. I feel comfortable with you. I like the way you wait on me and touch my cheek when you pass and rumple my hair and kiss my neck. In the sweet, shy way you wake up and smile when you see me beside you. I like the clever games you play, keeping me always guessing and always amused. I feel I have ten women in one. So now I feel I can't live without you. But I can't abandon my wife and marry you. She needs me. You should have been an actor, Bart. Your words move me to tears. Damn you for taking this so lightly, he bellowed. You've got me on a rack and you're twisting the screws. Don't make me hate you and ruin the best months of my life. With that, he stormed out of my cottage and I was left alone, ruefully regretting that always I talked too much, or I would stay as long as he needed me. Emma, Jory, and I thought it a wonderful idea to make an excursion to Richmond and do some Christmas shopping. Jory had never seen Santa Claus that he could remember, and most fearfully he approached the red-suited, white-bearded man who held out his arms to encourage him. Tentatively, he perched on Santa's knee in Thalheimer's department store and stared disbelievingly into twinkling blue eyes while I snapped pictures from every angle, even crawling to get what I wanted. Next, we visited a dress shop I'd heard about where I handed to them a sketch I'd drawn from memory. I selected the exact shade of dark green velvet and then the lighter green chiffon for the skirt. And make the straps of the velvet bodice shoestrings of rhinestones, and remember the floating panels must reach the hem. While Jory and Emma watched a Walt Disney movie, I had my hair cut and styled differently. Not just trimmed, as was my habit, but really cut shorter than I'd ever worn it. It was a style that flattered me, as it should, for it had flattered my mother when she wore her hair this way fifteen years ago. Oh, Mommy, cried Jory, distress in his voice. You've lost your hair. He began to cry. Put your long hair back on. You don't look like my Mommy now. No, that was the purpose. I didn't want to look like me this Christmas. Not this special Christmas when I had to duplicate exactly what my mother had been when first I saw her dancing with Bart. Now at long last, my chance in a gown the same as hers, with her hairstyle, her younger face. I would confront my mother in her own home on my terms, woman to woman, and let the best one win. She'd be forty-eight with a recent facelift. Still, I knew she was very beautiful, but she couldn't compete with her daughter, who was twenty-one years younger. I laughed when I looked in the mirror after slipping on the new green gown. Oh, yes, I'd made myself into what she was, the kind of woman men just couldn't resist. I had her power, her beauty, and ten times more brains. How could she win? Three days before Christmas, I called Chris and asked if he'd like to go with me to Richmond. I'd forgotten a few necessary items the little local shops didn't have. Kathy, he said sternly, his voice cold and hostile, when you give up Bart Winslow, you will see me again. But until you do, I don't care to be near you. All right, I flared. Stay where you are. You can miss out on your revenge. But I am not going to miss out on mine. Goodbye, Christopher Dahl, and I hope all the bedbugs bite. I hung up. I didn't teach ballet class as often as I used to, but at recital times I was always there. My little dancers delighted in dressing up and showing off before their parents, grandparents, and friends. They looked adorable in their costumes for the Nutcracker. Even Jory had two minor roles to play, a snowflake and a sugar plum. In my opinion, there was no more magical way to spend at least one Christmas Eve than as a family attending a performance of the Nutcracker. And it was a thousand times more wonderful when one of those gifted, small, graceful children was your own small son, fifty-two days short of being four years old. The sweet babiness of him, dancing on stage with so much passion, drew applause time and again from the audience who stood up to cheer his solo performance that I'd choreographed especially for him. And best of all, I'd made Bart swear he'd force my mother to attend that recital, and they were there, 
I checked by peeking through the curtains. Front row centre, Mr and Mrs Bartholomew Winslow. He looked happy, she looked grim. So I did have some control over Bart. It showed up in a huge bouquet of roses for the dance instructor and a huge box for the solo performing snowflake. What can it be? asked Jory, his face flushed, his happiness rebounding from the sky. Can I open it now? Sure, as soon as we're home, and tomorrow morning Santa will leave a hundred gifts for you. Why? Because he loves you. Why? asked Jory. Because he couldn't help but love you, that's why. Oh! Before five in the morning, Jory was up playing with the electric train Bart had sent him. All over the living room floor were the splendid wrappings from hundreds of gifts, from Paul, Henny, Chris, Bart and Santa Claus. Emma gave him a box of homemade cookies that he polished off between ripping open the packages. Gee, Mommy, he cried, I thought it would be lonely without my uncles, but I'm not lonely. I'm having fun. He wasn't lonely, but I was. I wanted Bart with me, not over there with her. I waited for him to make up some excuse to drive to the drugstore and slip over to see me and Jory. But all I saw of Bart on Christmas morning was the two-inch wide diamond bracelet he enclosed in a box with two dozen red roses. His card read, I love you, ballerina. If ever there was a woman who dressed more carefully than I did that night, it must have been Marie Antoinette. Emma complained it was taking me forever. I painted my face as if a camera was going to shoot me close up for a magazine cover. Emma styled my hair as my mother had worn hers long ago. Wave it back softly from the face, Emma, then catch it high at the crown with a cluster of curls, and make sure a few hang long enough to brush my shoulders. When she finished, I gasped to see I was almost an exact duplicate of what my mother had been when I was twelve. My high cheekbones were emphasized just as hers had been with this hairstyle. As in a dream I never truly expected to happen, I stepped into the green gown with the velvet bodice and chiffon skirt. This was the type of gown that never went out of fashion. I spun around before the mirror, getting the feel of being my mother with her power to control men, while Emma stood back and flattered me with compliments. Even my perfume was the same, musky with an oriental garden scent. My slippers were straps of silver with four-inch heels. My silver evening bag matched. All I needed now was the emerald and diamond jewellery she had worn. Soon I'd have that too. Surely fate wouldn't let her be wearing green tonight. At some point in my life fate had to be on my side. I figured it was due tonight. Tonight I'd deliver the surprises and the slaps. She would feel the pain of losing. What a pity Chris wouldn't come and enjoy the ending of a long, long play started the day our father was killed on the highway. I threw myself one more admiring glance, picked up the first stole Bart had given me, gathered up my faltering courage, took a last peek at Jory, who was curled up on his side and looking angelic. I leaned over to tenderly kiss his round, rosy cheek. I love you, Jory, I whispered. He partially awakened from a hazy dream and stared up at me as if I were part of that dream. Oh, Mommy, you look so pretty. His dark blue eyes shone with childish wonder as he asked quite seriously, Are you going to a party to get me a new daddy? I smiled and again kissed him and said, Yes, in a way I was. Thank you, darling, for thinking I look pretty. Now go back to sleep and dream of happy things, and tomorrow we'll build a snowman. Bring a daddy to help. On the table by the front door was a note from Paul. Henny is very ill. It's a pity you can't give up your plans to visit her before it is too late. I wish you good luck, Catherine. With a sigh, I put that note aside and picked up the note Henny had enclosed with Paul's, written on festive red paper, with the letters made crooked because of painful arthritic knuckles. Dear fairy child, Henny is old. Henny is tired. Henny is glad own son is by her side, but unhappy because other children far away. I tell you now, before I go on to better place, the simple secret of living happy. All you need do is say goodbye to yesterday's loves and hello to the new. 
Look around and see who needs you most and you won't go wrong. Forget who needed you yesterday. You write and say you have new baby inside you made by husband of your mother. Rejoice in child, even if mother's husband will stay married to her. Forgive your mother, even if once she did evil. Nobody all bad, and a lot of the good in her children must have come from her. When you can forgive and forget the past, peace and love will come again to you, and this time it will stay. And if you never in this world see Henny again, remember that Henny loved you well as her own daughter, just as I loved your angel sister, whom I expect to meet again soon. Soon to be in heaven, Henny. I put the note down with a heavy feeling of sadness in my chest, then shrugged my shoulders. What had to be done would be done. A long time ago I'd set my feet on this path, and I'd follow it come what may. How strange the wind wasn't blowing when I stepped out the door and turned to wave to Emma, who was spending the night with Jory. With boots covering my silver slippers, I headed for my car. How hushed it was, like nature was holding back in suspense as it focused on me. Soft as eiderdown, snow began to drift down. I glanced up at the grey leaden sky, so much like the grandmother's eyes. Resolved again, I turned the key in the ignition and headed toward Foxworth Hall, though I wasn't an invited guest. I'd stormed at Bart for that. Why didn't you insist and force her to invite me? Really, Kathy, isn't that a bit too much to ask? Can I insult my wife by asking my mistress to her party? I may be a fool, Kathy, but I am not that cruel. That first Christmas of imprisonment, when I was twelve, I'd lain with my head on Chris's boyish chest, wistfully wishing to be grown up, with curves as shapely as my mother's, with a face as beautiful as hers, wearing clothes as stunning as hers. And most of all, I'd wished to be in control of my life. Some Christmas wishes did come true. Chapter 34 Revelations just a little after ten o'clock, I used the wooden key Chris had carved so many years ago to slip unseen through a back door into Foxworth Hall. Already many guests were there, and more were still arriving. The orchestra was playing a Christmas carol, and faintly it drifted up to me, music so sweetly haunting I was taken back to my childhood. Only this time I was alone in alien territory with no one to back me up as I stole quietly up the back stairs keeping to the shadows, ready to hide quickly if necessary. I wended my solitary way to the grand central rotunda to stand near the cabinet where Chris and I had hidden to look down on another Christmas party. I gazed downward to spy upon Bart Winslow, standing beside his wife who was wearing bright red lame. His strong voice was hearty as he greeted his arriving guests warmly, shaking hands, kissing cheeks, acting the genial host in true fashion. My mother seemed somehow secondary to him, hardly needed at all in this huge mansion that was soon to be hers. Smiling bitterly to myself, I stole on to my mother's grand suite of rooms. It took me back in time. Oh, golly lolly! I used my little girl exclamation of delight, of surprise, of dismay or frustration, though I had better and more accurate words at my disposal now. Tonight I had no frustrations, only a lilting sense of justification. Whatever happened, she had brought it upon herself. Look, I thought, there was the splendid swan bed, still there, with the little swan bed across the foot. I glanced around, seeing it was all the same, but for the brocade fabric on the walls that was different. Now it was a soft plum colour and not strawberry pink. There was a brass valet to hold a man's suit ready and unwrinkled until he put it on. That was new. I hurried on into my mother's dressing room. On my knees I pulled out a special bottom drawer to feel around for the tiny button that had to be pushed in a certain combination of numbers to trigger the complicated lock. And would you believe it, she still used her birthday numbers of month, day and year. My, she was a trusting soul. In no time at all I had the huge velvet tray on the floor before me, so I could help myself to the emeralds and diamonds she had worn to that Christmas party when first Chris and I beheld Bartholomew Winslow. How we'd loved her then, and how we'd resented him. 
We had been still in the shadow of our grief for our father, and hadn't wanted Mama to marry again, not ever again. As in a dream I donned the emerald and diamond jewellery that went so well with my green velvet and chiffon gown. I glanced in the mirror to see if I looked as she had way back then. I was a few years younger, but yes, I did look like her. Not exactly, but almost, and enough to convince. For were two leaves from the same tree ever duplicates? I replaced the jewellery tray, put back the drawer, leaving everything as it had been. Except now I wore several hundred thousand dollars' worth of gems I didn't own. One more look at my watch. Ten-thirty. Too soon. At twelve I wanted to make my grand entrance, like Cinderella in reverse. With utmost caution I crept stealthily along the long halls to the northern wing and found that end room with the door locked. The wooden key still fitted. But my heart didn't seem to fit my chest. It beat too fast, too fierce, too loud, and my pulse raced too excitedly. I had to keep calm, self-possessed, do everything right, and not be intimidated by this awesome house that had done its best to destroy us. When I stepped into that room with the two double beds, I stepped back into childhood. The gold-colored quilted satin spreads were still on the beds, precisely made without a wrinkle. The ten-inch TV was still in the corner. The doll house, with its porcelain people and antique made-to-scale furniture, waited for Carrie's hands to bring it to life again. The old rocker that Chris had brought down from the attic, still there. Why, it was as if in here time stood still and we'd never left. Even hell was still on the walls, gruesomely represented by three reproductions of masterpieces. Oh, God, I hadn't known this room would make me feel so... so shredded inside. I couldn't afford to cry. That would make my mascara run. Yet I wanted to cry. All about me flitted the ghosts of Corey and Carrie, just five years old, laughing, crying, wanting outside the sunlight, and all they could do was push tiny trucks to make-believe San Francisco or Los Angeles. There used to be train tracks that ran all over the room and under the furniture. Oh, where did the train tracks go? The coal cars, the engines... I pulled a tissue from my tiny evening bag and held it to the corner of one eye and then the other. I leaned to peer into the dollhouse. The porcelain maids were still cooking in the kitchen. The butler still stood near the front door to welcome the guests arriving in a coach pulled by two horses. And lo, when I looked in the nursery, the cradle was there. The missing cradle. For weeks we'd hunted to find it, fearful all the time the grandmother would notice it missing and punish Carrie... And there it was, just where it should be. But the baby wasn't in it, nor were the parents in the front parlour. Mr. and Mrs. Parkins and baby Clara were now mine, and never would they reside in this dollhouse again. Had the grandmother herself stolen the cradle, so she could then see it missing and ask Carrie where it was, and when it couldn't be produced she'd have good reason to punish Carrie? and Corey as well, for he would automatically, without fear for himself, run to protect his twin sister. It was like her to do something mean and cruel like that. But if she had, why had she stayed her hand and not played out her role to the end? I laughed bitterly to myself. She had played out her role to the end, not just a whipping, but something better, something worse. Poison, arsenic on four sugared doughnuts. I jumped then. It seemed I heard a child laugh. My imagination, of course. And then, when I should have known better, I headed for the closet and the high and narrow door at the very back end and the steep and narrow dark stairs. A million times I descended these stairs, a million times in the dark without a candle or a flashlight, up into the dark, eerie, gigantic attic, and only when I was there did I feel around for the place where Chris and I had hidden our candles and matches. Still there. Time did stand still in this place. We'd had several candle holders, all of pewter with small handles to grasp. Holders we'd found in an old trunk, along with boxes and boxes of short, stubby, clumsily made candles. We'd always presumed them to be homemade candles, for they had smelled so rank and old when they burned. 
My breath caught. Oh, it was the same. The paper flowers still dangled down, mobiles to sway in the draughts, and the giant flowers were still on the walls. Only all the colors had faded to indistinct gray, ghost flowers. The sparkling gem centers we'd glued on had loosened, and now only a few daisies had sequins or gleaming stones for centers. Carrie's purple worm was there, only now he too was a nothing color. Corey's epileptic snail didn't appear a bright lopsided beach ball now. It was more a tepid, half rotten, squashy orange. The beware signs Chris and I had painted in red were still on the walls, and the swings still dangled down from the attic rafters. Over near the record player was the bar Chris had fashioned, then nailed to the wall so I could practice my ballet positions. Even my outgrown costumes hung limply from nails, dozens of them with matching leotards and worn-out point shoes, all faded and dusty, rotten-smelling. As in an unhappy dream I was committed to, I drifted aimlessly toward the distant schoolroom with the candlelight flickering. Ghosts were unsettled. Memories and spectres followed me as things began to wake up, yawn and whisper. No, I told myself, it was only the floating panels of my long chiffon wings, that was all. The spotted rocking horse loomed up, scary and threatening, and my hand rose to my throat as I held back a scream. The rusty red wagon seemed to move by unseen hands pushing it. So my eyes took flight to the blackboard, where I'd printed my enigmatic farewell message to those who came in the future. How was I to know it would be me? We lived in the attic, Christopher, Corey, Carrie, and me. Now there are only three. Behind the small desk that had been Corey's, I scrunched down and tried to fit my legs under. I wanted to put myself into a deep reverie that would call up Corey's spirit that would tell me where he lay. As I sat there waiting, the wind outside began to blow, picking up strength so it howled and hurled the snow slantwise. Another blizzard was on, full force. With the storm came the draft to blow out my candle. The darkness shrieked, and I had to run to get out, run fast, run, 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 before I became one of them. The next hour had been choreographed to the smallest detail. As the big grandfather clock began to strike twelve, I positioned myself in the center of the second floor balcony. I did nothing spectacular to pull all eyes my way, just stood there with my flesh warmed by the flashing jewels. In her crimson dress of lame, so high in front it reached her throat that was encircled with a lavish choker of diamonds, my mother slightly turned. I saw the backless gown made up for the severity in front, so a hint of her buttock cleavage showed. Her blonde hair was styled shorter than I'd ever seen it, and fluffed out around her face in a flattering way. From this distance she looked very young and lovely, and nowhere near her actual age. Ah, the last stroke of twelve sounded. Some sixth sense must have warned her, for she turned her head slowly to look my way. I began my descent. She froze in shock. Her eyes grew wide and dark as her hand that held a cocktail glass trembled so much a bit of the liquid sloshed out and fell to the floor. Because she stared, Bart followed the direction of her gaze. He gawked as if at an apparition. Now that both host and hostess were mesmerized, each guest had to look where no doubt they expected to see Santa Claus, and it was only me. Only me, as once my mother had been years ago, wearing the same gown, and before many I was sure of those very same people who were here that other Christmas when I was twelve. I even recognized a few, older, but I knew them. Oh, the joy to have them here. This was my moment of triumph. Moving as only a ballerina can, I meant to play my role to the utmost of my dramatic ability. As the guests stared upward, Clearly caught in thrall by time moved backward, I gloated to see my mother blanch. Then I rejoiced to see Bart's eyes widen more as they jumped from me to her, then back to me. Slowly, in a dead silence, for the music had stopped, I descended the left side of the dual winding staircases, 
thinking I was Carabus, the wicked fairy who put upon Aurora the curse of death. Then I made myself the lilac fairy to steal away Aurora's prince while she slept her sleep of one hundred years. It was clever of me not to think of myself as my mother's daughter and how soon I would destroy her. Very clever to make of this a stage production when I was dealing with reality and not fantasy and the blood that could be spilled. Gracefully I trailed my sparkling fingers along the rosewood railing, feeling my green chiffon wings fluttering and floating as step by step and second by second I neared the place where my mother and Bart were standing very close together. She was trembling all over but managing to hold on to her poise. I thought I glimpsed a flicker of panic in the blue of her Dresden eyes. I kindly bestowed on her my most gracious smile while standing on the second step from the bottom. In this way I gave myself the height I needed to be taller than anyone else. All had to look up to me, wearing four-inch silver heels on platform soles like Carrie's, so as to be on an even height with my mother when we met eye to eye, the better to see her dismay, her discomfort, her utter collapse. "'Merry Christmas!' I called to one and all in a loud, clear voice. It resounded like a heralding trumpet to attract others from different rooms, and they came in by the dozens, as if drawn more by the total silence but for my voice. "'Mr. Winslow,' I called invitingly, "'come dance with me just as you danced with my mother fifteen years ago when I was twelve and hiding above, and she wore a gown just like the one I have on now.' Bart was visibly jolted. Stunned shock made his dark eyes blacken, but he refused to move from my mother's side. He forced me to do what I did next. As everyone stood there and waited, held in breathless suspense, expecting more explosive revelations, I gave them what they wanted. I'd like to introduce myself. My voice was high-pitched, so it would carry well. I am Catherine Lee Foxworth, the first-born daughter of Mrs. Bartholomew Winslow, who most of you must remember was first married to my father, Christopher Foxworth. Remember, too, that he was my mother's half-uncle, the younger brother of Malcolm Neil Foxworth, who disinherited his only daughter, his sole remaining heir, because she had the unholy temerity to wed his half-brother. What is more, I also have an older brother named Christopher, too. He's a doctor now. Once I had a younger brother and sister, twins seven years younger than I. But Corey and Carrie are dead now, for they were... I stopped short for some reason, then went on. That Christmas party fifteen years ago, Chris and I were hiding in the chest on the balcony while the twins slept in the end room of the northern wing. Our playground was the attic, and never, never did we go downstairs. We were attic mice, unwanted and unloved once money came into the picture and I would have screamed it all out, every last detail, but Bart came striding over to me. Bravo, Kathy, he cried. You play your part to perfection. Congratulations. He put his arm about my shoulders, charmingly smiled at me, then turned to the guests, who appeared not to know what to think or whom to believe, much less how to react. Ladies, gentlemen, he said, let me introduce to you Catherine Dahl whom many of you must have seen on stage when she danced with her husband Julian Marquette, and as you have just witnessed, she is also an actress of merit. Kathy here is a distant relative of my wife, and if you can see any resemblance, that explains it. In fact, Mrs. Julian Marquette is one of our neighbors now, you may know that. Since her resemblance to my wife is so remarkable, we cooked up this little forest between us and did what we could to enliven and make different this party with our little joke. He ruthlessly pinched my upper arm before he caught my hand, put his arm about my waist, and asked me to dance. Come now, Kathy. Certainly you want to show off your dancing ability after that fine, dramatic performance. As the music began to play, he forcefully made me dance. I turned my head to see my mother sagging against a friend, her face so pale her makeup stood out like livid blotches. Even so, she couldn't take her eyes from me in the arms of her husband. "'You brazen little bitch!' Bart hissed at me. "'How dare you come in here and pull such a stunt? "'I thought I loved you. 
I despise catty women with long claws. I won't have you ruining my wife. You little idiot, whatever made you tell so many lies? You are the idiot, Bart, I said calmly, though I was panicked inside. What if he refused to believe? Look at me. How would I know she wore a gown like this if I hadn't seen her with it on? How would I know you went with her to see her bedroom with a swan bed if my brother Chris hadn't hidden and heard and seen everything the two of you did up on the second-floor rotunda? He met my eyes and he looked so strange, so distant and strange. Yes, Bart, darling, I am your wife's daughter, and I know if your law firm finds out your wife had four children born from the union of her first marriage, then you and she lose everything, all that money. All your investments, everything you have bought will be taken back. Oh, the pity of that makes me want to cry. We danced on, his cheek inches from mine. A smile was fixed to his lips. That gown you're wearing, how the hell did you find out she had one exactly like that the first time I came to this house to a party? I laughed with fake merriment. <laughs> Dear Bart, you are so stupid. How do you think I know... I saw her in this gown. She came to our room and showed us how pretty she looked, and I was so envious of all her curves and the way Chris looked at her with so much admiration. She wore her hair as I'm wearing mine now. These jewels were taken from her safe in the dressing room table drawer. You're lying, he said, but doubt was in his voice now. I know the combination, I went on softly. She used her birthday numbers. She told me that when I was twelve. She is my mother. She did keep us locked in that room waiting for her father to die so she could inherit. And you know why she had to keep us a big dark secret? You wrote the will, didn't you? Think back to a certain night when you fell asleep in her grand suite of rooms, and you dreamed a young girl wearing a short blue nightie stole in and kissed you. You weren't dreaming, Bart. That kiss was from me. I was fifteen then and had snuck into your room to steal money. Remember how you used to miss cash? You and she thought the servants were stealing, but it was Chris, and one time it was me, who didn't find anything because you were there to scare me away. No, he said with a sigh. No, she wouldn't do that to her own children. Wouldn't she? She did. That big chest up there near the balcony balustrade has a backing of wire mesh screening. Chris and I could see just fine. We saw the caterers fixing crepes and waiters in red and black, and a fountain spraying champagne, and there were two huge silver punch bowls. Chris and I could smell everything so delicious, and we drooled to have a taste of what was down there. Our meals were so boring and always cold or lukewarm. The twins hardly ate anything. Were you there the Thanksgiving Day dinner when she got up and down so much? Do you want to know why? She was preparing a tray of food to take up to us whenever the butler John was out of his pantry. He shook his head, his eyes dazed. Yes, Bart, the woman you married had four children she hid away for three years and almost five months. Our playground was in the attic. Have you ever played in an attic in the summertime, in the winter? Do you think it was pleasant? Can you imagine how we felt? waiting year after year for an old man to die so our lives could begin? Do you know the trauma we suffered, knowing she cared more for the money than she did for us, her own children? And the twins, they didn't grow. They stayed so small, grew so large-eyed and haunted-looking, and she'd come and never look at them. She pretended not to notice their ill health. Kathy, please, if you are lying, stop. Don't make me hate her. Why not hate her? She deserves it, I went on, as my mother went to lean against a wall and looked sick enough to throw up. Once I lay on the swan bed with the little swan bed across the foot. You had a book in your nightstand drawer about sex, disguised under a dust jacket that read, How to Create and Design Your Own Needlepoint, or something like that. How to Create Your Own Needlepoint Designs, he corrected, looking sick and as pale as my mother, though he kept on smiling, hatefully smiling. "'You are making all of this up,' he said, in an odd tone that showed no sincerity. "'You hate her because you want me, and connive to deceive me and destroy her.' I smiled and lightly brushed his cheek with my lips. 
Then let me convince you more. Our grandmother always wore grey taffeta with hand crochet collars and never without a diamond brooch with seventeen stones pinned at her throat. Very early each morning, before six thirty, she brought us food and milk in a picnic hamper. At first she fed us rather well, but gradually as her resentment grew, our meals grew worse and worse, until we were fed mostly sandwiches of peanut butter and jelly and occasionally fried chicken and potato salad. She gave us a long list of rules to live by, including one that forbade us from opening the draperies to let in light. Year after year we lived in a dim room without sunlight. If only you knew how dreary life is, shut away, without light, feeling neglected, unwanted, unloved. Then there was another rule very hard to abide by. We were not supposed to even look at each other, especially one of the opposite sex. Oh, God, he exclaimed, then sighed heavily. That sounds like her. You say it was more than three years you were locked up there? Three years and almost five months. And if that seems a long time to you, how do you think it was for small children of five and one of twelve and the other of fourteen? Back then five minutes passed like five hours and days were like months and months were like years. Doubt fought clearly with his legal mind that saw all the ramifications if my tale were true. Kathy, be honest, totally honest. You had two brothers and one sister, and all that time when I was here too you were living locked up? In the beginning we believed in her, every word she said, for we loved her, trusted her. She was our only hope and our salvation, and we wanted her to inherit all that money from her father. We agreed to stay up there until the grandfather died, although when our mother explained how we were to live in Foxworth Hall, she failed to mention we were to be hidden away. At first we thought it would only be for a day or so, but it went on and on. We filled our time by playing games, and we prayed a lot, slept a lot. We grew thin, half-sick, malnourished, and suffered through two weeks of starvation while you and our mother travelled throughout Europe on your honeymoon. And then you went to Vermont to visit your sister, where our mother bought a two-pound box of maple sugar candy. But by then we'd already been eating doughnuts with arsenic laced in the powdered sugar. He gave me a hard, fierce look of terrible anger. Yes, she did buy a box of that kind of candy in Vermont. But, Kathy, whatever else you may say, I can never believe my wife would deliberately set out to poison her own children. His scornful eyes raked over me, then back to my face. Yes, you do look like her. You could be her daughter, I admit that. But to say Corinne would kill her own children, I can't believe that. I shoved him away forcefully and whirled about. Listen, everyone, I yelled out. I am the daughter of Corinne Foxworth Winslow. She did lock her four children in the end room of the northern wing. Our grandmother was in on the scheme and gave us the attic for our playroom. We decorated it with paper flowers to make it pretty for our little twins, all so our mother could inherit. Our mother told us we had to hide, for if we didn't, our grandfather would never have her written into his will. All of you know how he despised her for marrying his half-brother. Our mother persuaded us to come and live upstairs and be as quiet as attic mice. We went trusting and believing she would keep her word and let us out the day her father died. But she didn't. She didn't. She let us suffer up there for nine months after he was dead and buried. I had more to spill out, but my mother shrilled out in a loud voice, Stop! She stumbled forward, her arms outstretched as if she were blind. You lie! she screamed. I've never seen you before. Get out of my house! Get out this instant before I call the police and have you thrown out. Now you get out and you stay out. Everyone was staring at her now, not me. She, the ultra-poised and arrogant, had lost control, was trembling, her face livid, wanting to scratch the eyes from my face. I don't think a soul there believed her then, not when they could see I was her very image, and I knew too many truths. Bart left my side and went to his wife to whisper something in her ear. He put his arms consolingly around her and kissed her cheeks. 
She clung to him helplessly with pale, shaky hands of desperation, beseeching his help with great teary eyes of cerulean blue, like mine, like Chris's, like the twins' blue eyes. Thank you again, Cathy, for a fine performance. Come into the library with me and I'll pay you your fee. He scanned over the guests, clustered around, and quietly he said, I'm sorry, but my wife has been ill and this little joke was ill-timed on my part. I should have known better than to plan such a show. So, if you will please forgive us, do go on with the party, enjoy yourselves, eat, drink, and be merry, and stay as long as you like. Miss Catherine Dahl may have some more surprises in store for you. How I hated him then. As the guests milled about and whispered and looked from me to him, he picked up my mother and carried her toward the library. She was heavier than she used to be, but in his arms she seemed a feather. Bart glanced over his shoulder at me, gestured with his head that I was to follow, which I did. I wanted Chris here with me as he should be. It shouldn't be left up to me to confront her with the truth. I was strangely alone, defensive, as if in the end Bart would believe her and not me, no matter what I said, no matter what proof I gave him. And I had plenty of proof. I could describe to him the flowers in the attic, the snail, the worm, the cryptic message I'd written on the blackboard. And most of all, I could show him the wooden key. Bart reached the library and carefully put my mother into one of the leather chairs. He snapped an order my way. Kathy, will you please close the door behind you? Only then did I see who else was in the library. My grandmother was seated in the same wheelchair her husband had used. Ordinarily, you can't tell one wheelchair from another, but this one was custom-made and much finer. She wore a grey-blue robe over her hospital jacket, and a lap robe covered her legs. The chair was placed near the fireplace so she could benefit from the heat of a roaring log fire. Her bald head shone as she turned it my way. Her flintstone grey eyes glowed maliciously. A nurse was in the room with her. I didn't take the time to look at her face. "'Mrs. Mallory,' said Bart, "'will you please leave the room and leave Mrs. Foxworth here?' "'It wasn't a request, but an order.' "'Yes, sir,' said the nurse, "'who quickly got up and scuttled to leave as fast as possible. "'You just ring for me when Mrs. Foxworth wants to be put to bed, sir,' "'she said at the door, and then disappeared. "'Bart seemed on the verge of exploding as he stalked the room.' and what wrath he felt now seemed directed not only at me, but also at his wife. All right, he said, as soon as the nurse was gone. Let's have done with it, all of it. Corinne, I've always suspected you had a secret, a big secret. It occurred to me many times you didn't truly love me, but it never once crossed my mind you might have four children you hid away in the attic. Why? Why couldn't you have come to me and told me the truth? He roared this, all control gone. How could you be so selfishly heartless, so brutally cruel as to lock away your four children and then try and kill them with arsenic? Sagging limply in a brown leather chair, my mother closed her eyes. She seemed bloodless as she asked in a dull voice, So you are going to believe her and not me? You know I could never poison anyone no matter what I had to gain. And you know that I don't have any children. I was stunned to know Bart believed me and not her. And then I guessed he didn't truly believe me, but was using a lawyer's trick, attacking and hoping to take her off guard and maybe get to the truth. But that would never work, not with her. She'd trained herself over too many years for anyone to take her by surprise. I strode forward to glare down at her, and in the harshest of voices I spoke. Why don't you tell Bart about Corey, Mama? Go on, tell him how you and your mother came in the night and wrapped him in a green blanket and told us you were taking him to a hospital. Tell him how you came back the next day and told us he died from pneumonia. Lies. All lies. Chris sneaked downstairs and overheard that butler, John Amos Jackson, telling a maid of how the grandmother carried arsenic up to the attic to kill the little mice. We were the little mice who ate those sugar donuts, Mother. And we proved those donuts were poisoned. Remember Corey's little pet mouse that you used to ignore? He was fed only a bit of sugar doughnut, and he died. Now sit there and cry and deny who I am, and who Chris is, and who Corey and Carrie used to be. 
I have never seen you before in my life, she said strongly, bolting upright and staring me straight in the eyes, except when I went to the ballet in New York. Bart narrowed his eyes, weighing her, then me. Then he looked at his wife again, and his eyes grew even more slot-like and cunning. Kathy, he said, still looking at her, you are making very serious allegations against my wife, you accuse her of murder, premeditated murder. If you are proven right, she will face a jury trial for murder. Is that what you want? I want justice, that is all. No, I don't want to see her in prison or put in an electric chair, if they still do that in this state. She is lying, whispered my mother. Lying, lying, lying. I had come prepared for accusations like this, and calmly I pulled from my tiny purse duplicates of four birth certificates. I handed them to Bart, who took them over to a lamp and bent to study them. Cruelly and with great satisfaction, I smiled at my mother. Dear mother, you were very foolish to sew those birth certificates in the lining of our old suitcases. Without them, I wouldn't have had any proof at all to show your husband, and no doubt he would go on believing you for I am an actress and accustomed to putting on a good show. Good show. It's a pity he doesn't know you are an even better actress. Cringe away, Mama, but I have the proof. I laughed wildly, near tears, as I saw them begin to glisten in her eyes, for once I had loved her so well, and under all the hatred and animosity I felt for her, a little light of innate love still waxed and waned, and it hurt. Oh, it did hurt to make her cry. Yet she deserved it. She did. I kept telling myself she did. You know something else, Mama? Carrie told me how she met you on the street and you denied her. And shortly afterwards she became so ill she died, so you helped kill her too. And without the birth certificates you could have escaped all retribution for that courthouse in Gladstone, Pennsylvania burned down ten years ago. See how kind fate would have been to you, Mother? But you never did anything well. Why didn't you burn them? Why did you save them? That was very thoughtless of you, dearest, loving mother, to save the evidence. But then you were always careless, always thoughtless, always extravagant about everything. You thought if you killed your four children, you could have others. But your father tricked you, didn't he? Kathy, sit down and let me handle this, ordered Bart. My wife has just undergone surgery, and I'll not have you threaten her health. Now sit before I push you down. I sat. He glanced at my mother, then at her mother. Corinne, if you have ever cared for me, loved me even a little, is any of what this woman says true? Is she your daughter? Very weakly, my mother answered. Yes. I sighed. I thought I heard the whole house sigh and Bart along with it. I lifted my eyes to see my grandmother staring at me in the oddest way. Yes, she continued flatly, her dull eyes fixed on Bart. I couldn't tell you, Bart. I wanted to tell you, but I was afraid you wouldn't want me if I came with four children and no money, and I loved and wanted you so much. I racked my brains trying to figure out a solution so I could keep you, my children, and the money, too. She sat up and made a ramrod of her spine as her head lifted regally high. And I did figure out a solution. I did. It took me weeks and weeks of scheming, but I did figure a way. Corinne, said Bart, with ice in his voice as he towered above her, murder is never a solution to anything. All you had to do was tell me, and I would have thought of a way to save your children and your inheritance. But don't you see, she cried out excitedly, I figured out a way all by myself. I wanted you, I wanted my children, and the money too. I thought my father owed me that money. She laughed hysterically, beginning to lose control again, as if hell was at her heels and she had to speak fast to escape its burn. Everyone thought I was stupid, a blonde with a pretty face and figure but no brains. Well, I fooled you, mother, she threw out at that old woman in the chair, and at a portrait on the wall she screamed, And I fooled you too, Malcolm Foxworth. Then at me she flared her eyes. 
And you too, Catherine. You thought you had it so tough up there, locked away, missing out on school days and friends. But you don't realize how good you had it compared to what my father did to me. You, you and your accusations, always at me. When could I let you out? When down below my father was ordering me to do this, do that. For if you don't, you won't inherit one penny. And I'll tell your lover about your four children, too. I gasped, then jumped to my feet. He knew about us? The grandfather knew? Again she laughed, hard, diamond, brittle laughter. Yes, he knew, but I didn't tell him. The day Chris and I ran away from this horrible house, he hired detectives to follow and keep tabs on us. Then when my husband was killed in that accident, I was persuaded by my lawyer to seek their help. How my father rejoiced. Don't you see, Kathy? She said so fast her words piled one on the other. He wanted me and my children in his house and under his thumb. He had it planned along with my mother to deceive me and let me think he didn't know you were hidden upstairs. But he knew all the time. It was his plan to keep you locked up for the rest of your lives. I gasped and stared at her. I doubted her, too. How could I trust anything she said now after she'd done so much? But grandmother, she went along with this plan, I asked, feeling a numbing sensation creeping up from my toes. Her, said Mama, tossing her mother a hard look of contempt. She'd do anything he said, for she hated me. She's always hated me. He loved me too much when I was a girl and cared nothing at all about his sons, whom she favored more. And after we were here, snared in his trap, he gloated to have his half-brother's children captured as animals in a cage to keep locked up until they were dead. So while you were up there playing your games and decorating the attic, he kept at me day in, day out. They should never have been born, should they, he'd slyly say, and cunningly suggest you would all be better off dead than kept prisoners until you grew old or sickened and died. I didn't truly believe he meant this at first. I thought it was only another of his ways to torture me. Each day he'd say you were wicked, flawed, evil children who should be destroyed. I'd cry, plead, go down on my knees and beg, and he'd laugh. One evening he raged at me. You fool, he said. Were you idiot enough to think I could ever forgive you for sleeping with your half-uncle, the ultimate sin against God, bearing his children? And on and on he'd rave, screaming sometimes. Then he'd lash out with his walking cane, striking whatever he could reach. My mother would sit nearby and smirk with pleasure. Yet he didn't let me know he knew you were up there for several weeks. And by that time I was trapped. She pleaded with me to believe, to have mercy. Can't you see how it was? I didn't know which way to turn. I didn't have any money, and I kept thinking his terrible temper tantrums would kill him, so I provoked him so he would die. But he kept on living and berating me and my children, and every time I went into your room you'd be pleading to be let out. Especially you, Kathy, especially you. And what else did he do to make you keep us prisoners, I asked sarcastically, except scream and rail and hit you with his cane. It couldn't have been very hard, for he was very frail, and we never saw any marks on you after the first whipping. You were free to come and go as you wanted. You could have worked out some plan to slip us outside unknown to him. You wanted his money, and you didn't care what you had to do to get it. You wanted that money more than you wanted your four children. Before my very eyes, her delicate and lovely restored face took on the aged look of her mother. She seemed to shrivel and grow haggard with the countless years she had yet to live with her regrets. Her gaze took wild flight, seeking some safe refuge in which to forever hide, not only from me but from the fury she saw in her husband's eyes. Kathy, pleaded my mother, I know you hate me, but yes, mother, I do hate you. You wouldn't if you understood. I laughed hard and bitterly. Dearest mother, there is not one thing you could tell me to make me understand. Corinne, said Bart, his tone sterile as if his heart had been removed. Your daughter is right. You can sit there and cry and talk about your father forcing you to poison your children, but how can I believe when I can't remember him even giving you a hard glance? He looked at you with love and pride. You did come and go as you chose. 
Your father lavished money on you so you could buy new clothes and everything else you wanted. Now you come up with some ridiculous tale of how you were tortured by him and forced by him to kill your hidden children. God, you sicken me. Her eyes took on a glassy stare. Her pale and elegant hands trembled as they unfolded and fluttered up from her lap to her throat, and there they fingered over and over again the diamond choker that must be keeping her gown from falling off. Bart, please, I'm not lying. I admit I've lied to you in the past and deceived you about my children, but I'm not lying now. Why can't you believe me? Bart stood with his feet spread apart, as a sailor would to brace himself on a rocky sea. His hands were behind his back and clenched into fists. What kind of man do you think I am or was? he asked bitterly. You could have told me anything then and I would have understood. I loved you, Corinne. I would have done anything legally possible to thwart your father and help you gain his fortune, and at the same time keep your children alive, free to live normal lives. I'm not a monster, Corinne, and I didn't marry you for your money. I would have married you if you were penniless. You couldn't outwit my father, she cried, jumping up and beginning to pace the floor. In that shiny crimson dress, my mother appeared a bright lick of flame, a color that made her eyes dark purple as they darted from one to the other of us. Then finally, when I couldn't stand to watch her as she was, broken, wild, with all her queenly poise gone, her eyes came to rest on her mother, that old woman who slumped in the wheelchair as if without bones. Her gnarled fingers worked weakly at the afghan, but her grey zealot's eyes burned with a strong, mean fire. I watched as the eyes of mother and daughter clashed. Those grey eyes that never changed, never softened with old age or fear of the hell that must be lying in wait for her. And to my surprise, from this confrontation, my mother rose straight and tall, the winner in this battle of wills. She began to speak in a dispassionate way, as if discussing someone else. It was like hearing a woman talk who knew she was killing herself with each razored word, and yet she didn't care, not any more. For I was the winner, after all. And to me, her most severe judge, she turned to appeal. All right, Kathy. I knew sooner or later I would have to face up to you. I knew it would be you who would force the truth from me. It has always been your way to look through me and guess I wasn't always what I wanted you to believe I was. Christopher loved me, trusted me, but you never would. Yet in the beginning, at the time your father was killed, I was trying to do the best I could by you. I told you what I believed to be the truth when I asked you to come and live here, hidden away until I won back my father's favor. I didn't truly think it would take more than one day, or possibly two. I sat as frozen, staring at her. Her eyes pleaded mutely. Have mercy, Kathy. Believe me, I speak the truth. She turned from me, and in great distress she appealed to Bart and spoke of their first meeting in a friend's home. I didn't want to love you, Bart, and involve you in the mess I was in. I wanted to tell you about my children and the threat my father posed to them, but just when I would, he'd worsen and appear ready to die, so I'd put it off and keep quiet. I prayed that when eventually I did tell you, you'd understand. It was stupid of me, for a secret kept too long becomes impossible to explain. You wanted to marry me. My father kept saying no. My children pleaded every day to be let out. Even though I knew they had every right to complain, I began to resent them. The way they kept harassing me, making me feel guilty and ashamed when I was trying to do the best I could for them. And it was Kathy. Always it was Kathy, no matter how many gifts I gave her, who kept at it the most. She threw me another of her long, tormented looks, as if I had tortured her beyond endurance. Kathy? she whispered then, her watery, drowning look of anguish brightening a little as once more she turned to me. I did do the best I could. I told my parents all of you did have hidden afflictions, especially Corey. They wanted to think God had punished my children, so they believed easily. And Corey was always having one cold after another, and his allergy. 
Can't you see what I tried to do? Make all of you just a little sick so I could rush you one by one to the hospital, then report back to my mother you died? I used a minute bit of arsenic, but not enough to kill you. All I wanted to do was make you a little bit sick, just enough to get you out. I was appalled by her stupidity to scheme in such a dangerous way. Then I guessed it was all a lie, just an excuse to satisfy Bart, who was staring at her in the oddest way. I smiled at her then, while inside I was hurting so badly I could cry. Mama, I said softly, interrupting her pleas, have you forgotten your father was dead before the sugar doughnuts started coming? You didn't have to trick him in his grave. She darted her tormented eyes to the grandmother, who had a stern, forbidding look fixed on her daughter. Yes, cried Mama, I knew that. But for that codicil I would never have needed the arsenic. But my father let our butler John in on our secret, and he was alive to see that I followed through and kept you upstairs until each one of you was dead. And if he didn't, then my mother was to see he didn't inherit the fifty thousand dollars promised to him. Then there was my mother who wanted John to inherit everything. A terrible silence came while I tried to digest this. The grandfather knew all the time and had wanted to keep us prisoners for life. And as if that weren't enough punishment, he then tried to force her to kill us. Oh, he must have been even more evil than I thought. Not human at all. Then, as I watched her and took note of her anxiously waiting blue eyes, her hands busily trying to twist an invisible rope of pearls, I knew she was lying. I glanced at the grandmother and saw her frown as she tried to speak. Fierce indignation was in her eyes, as if she would deny all my mother had said. But she hated Mama. She would want me to believe the worst. Oh, God, how was I to find out the truth? I glanced at Bart, who stood before the fire his dark eyes gazing at his wife as if he'd never seen her before, and what he was seeing now appalled him. Mama, I began in a flat voice, what did you really do with Corey's body? We have looked in all the cemeteries around here and checked their records, and not one little boy of eight years died in that last week of October 1960. She swallowed first and wrung her hands, flashing all the diamonds and other jewels. I didn't know what to do with him, she whispered. He died before I could reach the hospital. Suddenly he stopped breathing, and when I looked in the back seat, I knew he was dead. She sobbed with the memory. I hated myself then. I knew I could be charged with murder, and I hadn't meant to kill him, only make him a little sick. So I threw his body in a deep ravine and covered him over with dead leaves, sticks, and stones. Her huge, desperate eyes pleaded with me to believe. I, too, had to swallow, thinking of Corey in a deep, dark ravine left to decay there. No, Mama, you didn't do that. My soft voice seemed to cut through the frozen atmosphere of the huge library. I visited the end room of the northern wing before I came down here. I paused for better effect and made my next words more dramatic. Before I came down the stairs to confront you, I first used stairs that lead directly to the attic, then the hidden little stairway in the closet of our prison. Chris and I always suspected there was another way into the attic, and, correctly, we reasoned there had to be a door hidden behind the giant heavy armoires we couldn't shove out of the way no matter how hard we pushed. Mama, I found a small room we'd never seen before. There was a very peculiar odor in that room like something dead and rotten. For a moment she couldn't move. Her expression went totally blank. She stared at me with vacant eyes, and then her mouth and her hands began to work, but she couldn't speak. She tried, but she couldn't speak. Bart started to say something, but she put her hands up to her ears to shut out anything anyone would say. Suddenly the library door opened. I whirled in a fury. My mother turned as in a nightmare to see why I kept staring. Chris pulled up short and gazed at her. She jumped then as if terribly startled, then put up both her hands in a gesture that seemed to ward him off. Was she seeing a ghost of our father? Chris? she asked. 
Chris. I didn't mean to do it. Really, I didn't. Don't look at me like that, Chris. I love them. I didn't want to give them the arsenic, but my father made me. He told me they should never have been born. He tried to tell me they were so evil they deserved to die, and that was the only way I could make amends for the sin I'd committed when I married you. Tears streamed her cheeks as she went on, though Chris kept shaking his head. I love my children, our children, but what could I do? I only meant to make them a little sick, just enough to save them, that's all, that's all. Chris, don't look at me like that. You know I wouldn't ever kill our children. His eyes turned icy blue as he stared at her. Then you did deliberately feed us arsenic, he asked. I never fully believed it once we were free of this house and had time to think about it. But you did do it. She screamed then. In all my life I'd never heard such a scream as that one that rose and fell hysterically, screams that sounded like the howls of the insane. On her heel she whirled about, still screaming, as she raced for a door I hadn't even known was there, and through it she ran and disappeared. Kathy, said Chris, tearing his eyes from the door and scanning the library to take note of Bart and the grandmother, I've come to fetch you. I've had bad news. We have to go back to Claremont immediately. Before I could answer, Bart spoke up. Are you Kathy's older brother, Chris? Yes, of course. I came for Kathy. She's needed someplace else. He stretched out his hand as I drifted toward him. Wait a minute, said Bart. I need to ask you a few questions. I've got to know the full truth. Was that woman in the red dress your mother? First, Chris looked to me. I nodded to tell him Bart knew. And only then did Chris meet Bart's eyes with some hostility. Yes, she is my mother and Kathy's mother, and once the mother of twins named Corey and Carrie. And she kept all four of you locked up in one room for more than three years? asked Bart, as if he still didn't want to believe. Yes, three years and four months and sixteen days. And when she took Corey away one night, she came back later and told us he died of pneumonia. And if you want more details, you will have to wait, for there are others we have to think about now. Come, Kathy, he said, reaching for my hand again. We've got to hurry. He looked then at the grandmother and gave her a wry smile. Merry Christmas, grandmother. I had hoped never to see you again, but now that I have, I see time has worked its own revenge. He turned again to me. Hurry, Kathy, where is your coat? I have Jory and Mrs. Lindstrom out in my car. Why? I asked. Sudden panic filled me. What was the matter? No, objected Bart. Kathy can't leave. She's expecting my child, and I want her here with me. Bart came to take me in his arms, and tenderly he gazed with love at my face. You have lifted the blinders from my eyes, Kathy. You were right. Certainly I was meant for better things than this. Perhaps I can still redeem my existence by doing something useful for a change. I threw the grandmother a look of triumph and avoided looking directly at Chris, and with Bart's arm about my shoulders we left the library and the grandmother and strode through all the other rooms until we reached the grand foyer. Bedlam had broken loose. Everyone was screaming, running, searching to find a wife or a husband. Smoke. I smelled smoke. My God, the house is on fire, Bart cried. He shoved me toward Chris. Take her outside and keep her safe. I've got to find my wife. He looked wildly about, calling, Corinne, Corinne, where are you? The milling throng were all headed for the same exit. From the stairs above, black smoke billowed down. Women fell and people stepped over them. Merry guests of the party were hell-bent now on getting out, and woe to those who didn't have the strength to fight their way to the door. Frantically, I tried to follow Bart with my eyes. I saw him pick up a telephone, no doubt to call the fire department, and then he was racing up the right side of the dual staircase and into the very heart of the fire. No! I screamed. Bart, don't go up there. You'll be killed. Bart, don't! Come back! I think he must have heard me, for he hesitated midway up and smiled back at me as I was frantically waving. He mouthed the words, I love you, and then pointed toward the east. I didn't understand what he meant, but Chris took it that he was telling us of another way out. 
Coughing and choking, Chris and I sped through another parlor, and finally I had the chance to see the grand dining room, but it was full of smoke, too. Look, cried Chris, pulling me on. There are French doors. The fools. There must be a dozen or more exits on the first floor, and everyone rushes for the front door. We made it outside, and finally over to the car I recognized as Chris's, and there Emma held Jory in her arms as she stared at the great house that was burning. Chris reached inside and pulled out a car robe to throw over my shoulders, and then he held to me as I leaned against him and sobbed for Bart. Where was he? Why didn't he come out? I heard the wail of fire engines winding around the hills, screaming in the night that was already wild with the wind and the snow. The snow that fell above the house on fire was speckled red dots that sizzled as they met the flames. Jory put out his arms, wanting me, and I held him close, as Chris put his arms about me and held us both. "'Don't worry, Cathy,' he tried to comfort. "'Bart must know all the ways to get out.' Then I saw my mother in her red flame dress being restrained by two men. She screamed on and on, crying out her husband's name, and then that of the grandmother. "'My mother! She is in there! She can't move!' Bart was on the front steps when he heard her voice. He whirled about and sped back into the house. Oh, my God! He was going back to save the grandmother who didn't deserve to live, risking his life, doing what he had to to prove, after all, he wasn't just a lapdog. This was the fire of my childhood nightmares. This was what I'd always feared more than anything. This was the reason I'd insisted we make the rope ladder of torn-up sheets so we could escape and reach the ground, just in case. It was more than horrible to watch that mammoth house burn when once I would have been glad to see it go. The wind blew relentlessly and whipped the flames higher, higher, until they lit up the night and fired the heavens. How easily old wood burned, along with the antique furnishings, the priceless heirlooms that could never be replaced. If anything survived... Despite what those heroic firemen did who raced about like crazy, connecting up hoses that squirted forth foam, it would be a miracle. Someone screamed, People are trapped inside! Get them out! I think it was me. The firemen worked with superhuman speed and agility to get them out, while I cried wild and frantic, Bart! I didn't want to kill you! I only wanted you to love me, that's all! Bart, don't die! Please don't die! My mother heard, and she came running to where Chris was holding me tight in his arms. You, she screamed, her distraught expression that of the insane. You think Bart loved you, that he would marry you. You are a fool. You betrayed me, as you've always betrayed me. And now Bart will die because of you. No, mother, said Chris, who tightened his arms about me, and his tone was that of ice. It wasn't Kathy who cried out to remind your husband your mother was still inside. You did that. You must have seen he couldn't go back in that house and live. Perhaps you would rather see your husband dead than married to your daughter. She stared at him. Her hands worked nervously. Her cerulean blue eyes were darkly shadowed by the pools of black mascara. And as I watched, and Chris watched, something in her eyes broke. Some minute thing that had lent clarity and intelligence to the eyes dissolved, and she seemed to shrink. Christopher, my son, my love, I'm your mother. Don't you love me any more, Christopher? Why? Don't I bring you everything you need and ask for? New encyclopedias, games and clothes? What is it you lack? Tell me so I can go out and buy it for you. Please tell me what you want. I'll do anything, bring you anything to make up for what you're losing. A thousandfold over you will be rewarded when my father dies, and he will die any day, any hour, any second, I know. I swear you won't have to be up here much longer. No, not much longer, not much longer, not much longer. And on and on until I could have screamed. Instead, I put my hands over my ears and pressed my face against Chris's broad chest. He made some signal to one of the ambulance drivers, and wearily they approached our mother, who saw them, shrieked, and then tried to run. I saw her stumble and fall, her heel caught in the long hem of her flaming red glittering gown, and on the snow she fell flat, kicking, screaming, and pounding her fists. 
They took her away in a straitjacket, still screaming of how I had betrayed her, while Chris and I clung to one another and watched with wide eyes. We felt like children again, helpless with the fresh grief and shame we bore. I followed him about while he did what he could for those who had been burned. I only got in his way, but I couldn't let him out of my sight. The body of Bart Winslow was found on the floor of the library, with the skeletal grandmother still clutched in his arms, both suffocated by the smoke and not the flames. I stumbled over to fold down the green blanket and stared into his face to convince myself death had come again into my life. Again and again it kept coming. I kissed him, cried on his unyielding chest. I raised my head and he was looking straight at me and through me, gone on to where I could never reach him and confess that I had loved him from the start, fifteen years ago. Kathy, please, said Chris, tugging me away. I sobbed when Bart's hand slipped from my grasp. We have to go. There's no reason for us to stay on now that it is all over. All over? All over? It was all over. My eyes followed the ambulance with Bart's body inside, and my grandmother, too, I didn't grieve for her, for she had got out of life what she put in. I turned to Chris and cried again in his arms, for who would live long enough to let me keep the love I had to have? Who? Hours and hours passed while Chris pleaded with me to leave this place that had brought us nothing but unhappiness and sorrow. Why hadn't I remembered that? Sadly I leaned, picked bits and pieces of craft paper that once had been orange and purple, and other pieces of our attic decorations blew on the wind, torn petals, jagged leaves ripped from their stems. It was dawn before the fire was brought under control. By that time the mammoth greatness that had once been Foxworth Hall was only a smouldering ruin. The eight chimneys still stood on the sturdy brick foundation, and oddly enough the dual winding staircases that curved up into nowhere still remained. Chris was eager to depart, but I had to sit and watch until the last wisp of smoke was blown away and became part of the wind called Nevermore. It was my salute, the final one to Bartholomew Winslow, whom I'd first seen at the age of twelve. On first sight I'd given my heart to him, so much so that I had to have Paul grow a moustache so he'd look more like Bart, and I'd married Julian because his eyes were dark, dark like Bart's. Oh, God, how could I live with the knowledge I had killed the one man I'd loved best? Please, please, Kathy. The grandmother is gone, and I can't say I'm sorry, though I am about Bart. It must have been our mother who started the fire. From what the police say, it began in that attic room at the top of the stairs. His voice came to me as from a far distance, for I was locked up in a shell of my own making. I shook my head and tried to clear it, who was I? Who was that man next to me? Who was the little boy in the back seat asleep in the arms of an older woman? What's the matter with you, Kathy? Chris said impatiently. Listen, Henny had a massive stroke tonight. In trying to help her, Paul suffered a heart attack. He needs us. Are you going to sit here all day, too, and grieve for a man you should have left alone and let the one man who has done the most for us die? The grandmother had said a few things so right. I was evil, born unholy. Everything was my fault, all my fault. If I'd never come, if I'd never come, on and on I kept saying this to myself as I cried bitter tears for the loss of Bart. Chapter 35 The Last Chapter Reaping the Harvest It was autumn again, that passionate month of October. The trees this year were ablaze from the touch of early frost. I was on the back veranda of Paul's big white house, shelling peas and watching Bart's small son chase after his older half-brother, Jory. We'd named Bart's son after him, thinking it only right, but his last name was Sheffield, not Winslow. I was now Paul's wife. 
In a few months, Jory would be seven years old, and though at first he'd been a bit jealous, he was now delighted to have a younger brother to share his life, someone he could boss, instruct, and patronize. However young, Bart was not the kind to take orders. He was his own person right from the beginning. Catherine, called Paul's weak voice. I put the bowl of green peas quickly aside and hurried to his bedroom on the first floor. He was able to sit up in a chair for a few hours a day now, though on our wedding day he'd been in bed. On our wedding night he'd slept in my arms, and that was all. Paul had lost a great deal of weight. He looked gaunt. All his youth and vitality, held on to so valiantly, had disappeared almost overnight. Yet he'd never moved me more than when he smiled at me and held out his arms. I'd just called to see if you'd come. I ordered you to get out of this house for a change. You're talking too much, I cautioned. You know you aren't supposed to talk but a little. This was a sore point with him to only listen and not join in, but he tried to accept it. His next words took me by complete surprise. I could only stare at him, mouth agape and eyes wide. Paul, you don't mean that. Solemnly he nodded, his still beautiful iridescent eyes holding mine. Catherine, my love, it's been almost three years that you have been a slave to me, doing your best to make my last days happy, but I'm never going to get well. I could live on like this for years and years, like your grandfather did, while you grow older and older and miss out on the best years of your life. I'm not missing out on anything, I said with a sob in my throat. He smiled at me gently and held out his arms, and gladly I went to cuddle on his lap, though his arms about me no longer felt strong. He kissed me and I held my breath. Oh, to be loved again! But I wouldn't let him, I wouldn't. Think about it, my darling. Your children need a father, the kind of father I can't be now. It's my fault, I cried. If I had married you years ago instead of Julian, I could have kept you well and forced you not to work so hard and drive yourself night and day. Paul, if we three hadn't come into your life, you wouldn't have had to earn so much money, enough to send Chris through college and me to ballet classes. He put his hand over my mouth and told me, but for us, he would have died years ago from overwork. Three years, Catherine, he said again. And when you think about it, you will realize you are very much a prisoner, just as when you were in Foxworth Hall waiting for your grandfather to die. I don't want you and Chris to grow to hate me, so think about it, and talk to him about it, and then decide. Paul, Chris is a doctor. You know he wouldn't agree. Time is running out, Catherine, not only for me, but for you and Chris, too. Soon Jory will be seven years old. He will be remembering everything more clearly. He will know Chris is his uncle. But if you leave now and forget about me, he will consider Chris his stepfather, not his uncle. I sobbed. No, Chris would never agree. Catherine, listen to me. It wouldn't be evil. You are now unable to have more children. Though I was terribly sorry you had such a difficult time giving birth to your last son, maybe it was a blessing in disguise. I'm impotent, I'm not a real husband, and soon you will be a widow again. And Chris has waited for so long. Can't you think about him and forget the sin? And so, like Mama, we'd written our scripts too, Chris and I. And maybe ours were no better than hers, though I'd never plotted to kill anyone. Nor had I meant to drive her over the brink of insanity, so the rest of her life she'd live in a convalescent home. And the irony of ironies, when all that she'd inherited from her father had been taken away, it had reverted to her mother. The grandmother's will had been read, and her entire fortune, plus the remains of Foxworth Hall, now belonged to a woman who could only sit in a mental institution and stare at four walls. Oh, Mama, if only you could have looked into the future when first you considered taking your four children back to Foxworth Hall cursed with millions and unable to spend a cent. Nor would one penny come to us. When our mother died, it would be distributed to different charities. 
In the spring of the following year, we sat near the river water where Julia had led Scotty, then held him under so he drowned in the shallow greenish water where my own two small sons sailed small boats and waded in water that only reached their ankles. Chris, I began falteringly, embarrassed and yet happy too. Paul made love to me last night for the first time. We were both so happy we cried. It was safe enough, wasn't it? He bowed his head to hide his expression, and the sun blazed his golden hair. I'm happy for the both of you. Yes, sex is safe enough now, as long as you don't work him up to a great pitch of excitement. We took it easy. After four severe heart attacks, it had to be easy sex. Good. Jory shrieked out then he'd caught a fish. Was it too small? Would he have to throw back another? Yes, called Chris. That's just a baby. We don't eat baby fish, only the big ones. Come, I called. Let's head for home and dinner. They came running and laughing, my two sons, both so much alike they appeared whole brothers and not halves, and as yet we hadn't told them any different. Jory hadn't asked, and Bart was too young to question. But when they did, we would tell them the truth, as difficult as it was. "'We've got two daddies!' cried Jory, flinging himself into Chris's arms as I picked up Bart. "'Nobody at school but me has two daddies, and they don't understand when I tell them. But maybe I don't tell it right.' "'I'm sure you don't tell it right,' said Chris with a small smile. In Chris's new blue car, we drove home to the big white house that had given us so much. As we had the first time we came, we saw a man on the front veranda with his white shoes propped up on the balustrade. As Chris took my sons into the house, I went over to Paul and smiled to see him dozing with a pleased smile upon his face. The newspaper he'd been reading had slipped from his slack hand to fan on the veranda floor. "'I'll go in and bathe the boys,' whispered Chris, "'and you can pick up the newspapers before the wind blows them onto our neighbors' lawns.' As quietly as you can try to pick up papers and fold them neatly, somehow they will crackle and rustle, and soon Paul half opened his eyes and smiled at me. Hi, he said sleepily. Did you have a good day? Catch anything? Two small fish bit on Jory's line, but he had to throw them back. What were you dreaming before you woke? I asked, leaning to kiss him. You looked so happy. Was it a sexy dream? Again he smiled, sort of wistfully. I was dreaming of Julia, he said. She had Scotty with her, and they were both smiling at me. You know, she very seldom smiled at me after we married. Poor Julia, I said, kissing him again. She missed out on so much. I promise my smiles will make up for all she didn't give. They already have. He reached to touch my cheek and stroke my hair. It was my lucky day when you climbed my veranda steps on that Sunday. That damned Sunday, I corrected. He smiled. Give me ten minutes more before you call me in to dinner. I'd like to get hold of that bus driver and tell him no Sundays are damned when you are on the bus. I went in to help Chris with the boys, and while he buttoned up Jory's PJs, I helped Bart Scott Winslow Sheffield with his yellow pyjamas, we ate early so we could dine with our children. Soon the ten minutes were up, and again I went to waken Paul. Three times I said his name softly and stroked his cheek gently, then blew in his ear. Still he slept on. I started to say his name again and louder when he made some small sound that sounded like my name. I looked, already trembling and afraid. Just the strangeness of the way he said that filled me with a terrible dread. "'Chris!' I called weakly. "'Come quick and look at Paul.' He must have been in the hall, sent by Emma to see what was taking us so long, for he stepped out of the door immediately, then ran to Paul's side. He seized up his hand and felt for his pulse, and then in another second he was pulling his head back and holding his nose and breathing into his mouth. When that didn't work, he struck him several times very hard on his chest. I ran into the house and called an ambulance. But, of course, none of it did any good. Our benefactor, our saviour, my husband, was dead. 
Chris put his arm about my shoulder and drew me to his chest. He's gone, Kathy, the way I would like to go, in my sleep, feeling well and happy. It's a good way for a good man to die, with no pain and no suffering. So don't look like that. It's not your fault. Nothing was ever my fault. Behind me lay a trail of dead men. But I wasn't responsible for the death of even one, was I? No, of course not. It was a wonder Chris had the nerve to climb in the car and sit beside me, heading his car west. Behind us we trailed a U-Haul with all our worldly goods inside, going west like the pioneers to seek a new future and find different kinds of lives. Paul had left everything he owned to me, including his family home, though his will had stated if I decided to sell he wanted Amanda to have the final bid. So at last Paul's sister had their ancestral home she had always wanted and schemed to get, but I made sure it was at a steep price. Chris and I rented a home in California until we could have a custom-designed ranch house built to our specifications with four bedrooms and two and a half baths. Plus we had another bath and bedroom for our maid, Emma Lindstrom. My sons call my brother Daddy. They both know they have other fathers who went on to heaven before they were born. So far they don't realize Chris is only their uncle. A long time ago Jory forgot that. Maybe children, too, forget when they want to, and ask no questions that would be embarrassing to answer. At least once a year we travel east to visit friends, including Madame Marisha and Madame Zolta. Both make a great to-do about the dancing abilities of Jory, and both try with fervent zeal to make Bart a dancer, too. But so far he doesn't have the inclination to be anything but a doctor. We visit all the graves of our beloved ones and put flowers there, always red and purple ones for Carrie and roses of any colour for Paul and Henny. We have even sought out our father's grave in Gladstone and paid our respects to him too with flowers, and Julian is never overlooked, or Georges. Last of all, we visit Mama. She lives in a huge place that tries unsuccessfully to look homey. Usually she screams when she sees me. Then she jumps up and tries to tear the hair from my head. When she is restrained, she turns the hatred upon herself, trying time after time to mutilate her face and free herself forever of any resemblance to me, just as if she no longer looked in the mirrors that would tell her we no longer look alike. Remorse has made of her something terrible to see, and once she'd been so very beautiful. Her doctors allow only Chris to visit with her an hour or so while I wait outside with my two sons. He reports back that if she recovers she won't be faced with a murder charge for both Chris and I have disclaimed there ever was a fourth child named Corey. She doesn't fully trust Chris, sensing he is under my evil influence and if she lets go her facade of being insane she will end up with a death penalty. So year after year passes as she clings to her calculated fallacy as a way to escape also the future with no one who really cares for her. Or perhaps more truly she seeks to torment me through Chris and the pity he insists on feeling for her. She is the one issue that keeps our relationship from being perfect. So the dreams of perfection, of fame, of fortune, of undying, ever-abiding love without one single flaw, like the toys and games of yesteryears and all other youthful fantasies I have outgrown, I have put away. Often I look at Chris and wonder just what it is he sees in me. What is it that binds him to me in such a permanent way? I wonder, too, why he isn't afraid for his future and the length of it since I am better at keeping pets alive than husbands. But he comes home jauntily, wearing a happy grin as he strides into my welcoming arms that respond quickly to his greeting. Come greet me with kisses if you love me. His medical practice is large, but not too large, so he has time to work in our four acres of gardens with the marble statues we brought along from Paul's gardens. As much as possible we have duplicated what he had, except for the Spanish moss that clings and clings and then kills. Emma Lindstrom, our cook, our housekeeper, friend, 
lives with us as Henny lived with Paul. She never asks questions. She has no family but us, and to us she is faithful, and our business is our own. Pragmatic, blithe, the eternal cockeyed optimist, Chris sings when he works in the gardens. When he shaves in the mornings, he hums some ballet tune, feeling no trepidations, no regrets, as if long, long ago he had been the man who danced in the shadows of the attic and had never, never let me see his face. Did he know all along that just as he had won over me in all other games, it would be him in the end? Why hadn't I known? Who had shut my eyes? It must have been Mama who told me once, Marry a man with dark, dark eyes, Kathy. Dark eyes feel so terribly intense about everything. What a laugh! As if blue eyes lacked some profound steadfastness. She should have known better. I should know better, too. It worries me because I went yesterday into our attic. In a little alcove to the side, I found two single size beds, long enough for two small boys to grow into men. Oh, my God, I thought, who did this? I would never lock away my two sons, even if Jory did remember one day that Chris was not his stepfather but his uncle. I wouldn't, even if he did tell Bart, our youngest. I could face the shame, the embarrassment, and the publicity that would ruin Chris professionally. Yet, yet, today I bought a picnic hamper, the kind with the double lids that open up from the centre, the very same kind of hamper that Grandmother had used to bring us food. So I go uneasily to bed and lie there awake, fearing the worst in myself and struggling to keep firm hold of the best. It seems, as I turn over and snuggle closer to the man I love, that I can hear the cold wind blowing from the blue-misted mountains so far away. It's the past that I can never forget that shadows all my days and hides furtively in the corners when Chris is home. I do make an effort to be like he is, always optimistic, when I am not at all the kind who can forget the tarnish on the reverse side of the brightest coin. But I am not like her. I may look like her, but inside I am honourable. I am stronger, more determined. The best in me will win out in the end. I know it will. It has to sometimes, doesn't it? This concludes the reading of Petals on the Wind by V.C. Andrews. This book was read by Donada Peters.